How do you do that? Oh, I don't know. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I, <clears throat> it has gone uh, past the time we should start slightly. So, uh, welcome everyone. This meeting is being held in the supper room of the Wahinga Centre, 62 Texas Street, Marlborough, and via audio visual conference. All members participating via audio visual conference will count for the purpose of a meeting forum. In accordance with clause 25b of schedule 7 of the local government act this meeting will be live streamed and will be available to view on our youtube channel so right we'll crack into it uh, apologies i have one from Re rebecca fox and also pip maynard for lateness uh, Pam did send an apology, but she's not a member, but uh, she does sit in on this. Uh, do we have any conflicts? Uh, good. No public uh, participation. Um, I just want to note that we do have Anne Rainford here from the Great Out Community Board. Oh, and Colin is sitting in here because of his expertise around the water races. I think Council West. And Council always, yes, I was coming to bring it. I, I move we accept the apologies. Yep. We have a second. Yeah. All in favour? No, it's fine. Right. right. Thank you, uh, Mr. <laughs> Sorry. He's got point. So we have no action from public participation. No extraordinary business, no. And we now move to 86, which is minutes for confirmation. Uh, would someone like to move? We uh, accept the minutes. Yeah, I will. And Alistair, all in favour? Aye. Aye. Now, is there any um, comments or any alterations? Alistair. Could, could we, uh, the, the action items report, I know we're going to get to it, but we might just talk about the Underhill Road thing because it seems to have spread now from um, uh, from the side of Greytown side now to uh, the, the comments about the safety on it. Um, so it might be good to get a bit of an update on where we are on that. We'll, we'll get to that, Harry, um, during action items, will we? Oh, look, I can share what I know, um, but um, obviously Steph and, and Bryce are both on leave, so um, I can only, I'd be able to just let you know what, where things are up to. Yep, okay. You're right with that, Alistair? Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, we just need to keep it, keep it, because it's quite topical in both towns, really. Yep, yep. Okay. Right, we are moving to B1, uh, decision reports. Um, do we have a mover to receive the report? Alistair, I'll second that. Are we all in favour? No. Aye. Aye. Right. Uh, so, is she on there? Yes. Oh, oh, if, yeah. I, yeah. if I just perhaps just um, outline the the basis of this paper. So, um, the um, Planning and um, Regulatory Committee were briefed on this work. Yep. Um, and we're very, actually very excited about this. I think it's a really exciting initiative. And yep. um, I can certainly commend Steve um, for um, bringing this to the fore. Our young people are probably the most crucial resource um, for our future in, in, the, um, in South Wairapa and the Wairapa, or in New Zealand as a whole. Um, so but the, the base of this paper is it gives us um, a move from what we initially informed the committee, which was a, basically a consultation process um, yep. with limited engagement with young people to uh, more of a code, shifts the whole process to a co-design model where we have more um, engagement um, with the young people and the actual development of the strategy, not writing a strategy and then um, asking them what they think of it next, which I think is just um, very laudable and the right thing to do. So with that in mind, I'll just take Steve to... Um, walk you through it. I've asked her just to give a bit of a background because a number of few of you that weren't at the um, yeah. planning and read committee, just to, just to um, give a bit of context to what's before you. So, Steve. 
Kia ora, Alex. Um, kia ora koutou koutoua. Ko si piaras da tōku ingoa. Um, thanks for having me here. So, yeah, I'm just going to provide a, a little bit of a run-through on the revised approach for the review and the development of the Wairarapa Rangatahi strategy. Um, so the Masterton, Carterton and South Wairarapa District Councils have agreed to develop a combined Wairarapa Rangatahi strategy and action plan. The strategy is a new strategy for the for our council, which will um, enable us to set a vision and priorities to progress youth development outcomes for the South Wairapa District and support the provision of a regional lens on youth development needs, which is also really exciting, which will enable greater awareness of strengthening rangatahi voice, well-being and participation in civic affairs. Um, the Council's commitment to Rangatai and Tamaraki uh, wellbeing is already recognised through our contract with the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs, community and partnership grants to youth development and initiatives such as the skate park in Great Town. And um, the strategy is consistent with the strategic framework and connects strongly with our social and cultural wellbeing outcomes. So um, as Harry Mentioned in uh, February 2022, we reported to Council on a proposed approach for the review of the strategy <clears throat> and the action plan, and at the time with a view to deliver documents in September. Um, as we all know, the, um, the pandemic hit, um, and as a result of the pandemic, and also other feedback that has come in from stakeholders that we have been working with um, uh, over the period of March, um, a revised approach is proposed uh, based on that. So some of the key considerations that inform the revised approach are um, the original approach relied on opportunities for face-to-face -face engagement, um, events and workshops to encourage survey participation from our youth. The pandemic ended up... Um, cancelling many of these and restricting many of these opportunities. And we do expect that that will continue to um, happen to some extent uh, in, in the future. We also heard from uh, our schools and stakeholders that Rangatahi actually had been really frequently surveyed over the last year. <clears throat> and as a result, there is a bit of a general fatigue with surveys as a main form of engagement. And the original approach, um, therefore, um, would, was looking like it would lead to a very low uptake on the survey. We've also heard from leading initiatives and organisations in the youth development area um, that approaches that are rangatahi led or based on co-design with rangatahi um, are really successful. They enable increased participation and meaningful outcomes for our community. So we've identified a revised approach, which is um, going to lead, we think, to greater involvement, insights and developments. And some of the key features of that revised approach include building a diverse rangatahi focus group with participation from across the region, including representation from our rural and coastal rangatahi, our rainbow rangatahi, disabled rangatahi, rangatahi Māori, Asia and Pacific rangatahi. So having this focus group work with us from the start, more or less, and involved as champions in the community will help us make sure that we can have those discussions or they can have their discussions with the peers and support the wider engagement on the strategy. It will help us make sure that our champions are going to be diverse and relatable and relevant to their peers, and that will support greater uptake and engagement. And the Rangatai Focus Group will continue to bring their knowledge and experience to workshop any feedback that is received and in the continued development of the strategy. Um, staff has also uh, been fortunate to receive advice from the Wairarapa Working, sorry, the Wairarapa Policy Working Group with regards to drafting of terms of reference and the approach and the, and the uh, proposed approach. And we are in the process of receiving advice from Mana Whenua and other stakeholders around what recruitment might look like. So um, 
The change to co-design and collaboration um, will see greater, wider, more diverse and meaningful engagement. And this is quite exciting because for many young people, this will be the first time that they engage with um, local government. So it's an opportunity to make the experience a really positive experience for them. And I think that if we can do that and if we can, um, then we can, then we can encourage uh, really strong civic participation in, in the future as well. And if our children and young people are well, then our community as well. So there's huge benefits with um, a really good engagement. Our deliverables will look slightly different with a shift to recruitment of the Rangatahi Focus Group. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, we will have some, we will have continued advice from the Wairarapa Policy Working Group and our stakeholders as we move through the process. There will be some changes to timelines, but staff and the Rangatahi Focus Group should be able to deliver principles and goals by July 2022 ready to test with our community. And then we expect to have a final strategy ready for adoption in February, March, 2023. Um, so next steps, subject to council approval, we will update our relevant stakeholders and mana whenua on our approach. And following an agreed um, terms of reference, we will also actively seek nominations for the focus group and run through the relevant selection process. Um, and that's it from me. So if you have any questions, I'd be really happy to try to answer those. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for that. Just first, I'd just like to ask whether Alice or Gary have anything to add to that. If I may, so just the comment was that we were going to take a, um, a broad brush um, document to council, uh, the three councils, that is. Uh, what's the timing on that going to be? Um, did that come out of a recent discussion? Yes, yes, we talked about eight, but obviously that's not going to happen. But I just wondering, I mean, it'd be quite nice to have so all the council would actually know what's going on. That's that's the point. Um, well, we're we're if this approach that we're proposing now is um, approved, then I guess the 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 strategy. Uh, sorry, the. Sorry, can I can I help Steve here? So, um, yeah. what we, um, so the whole intention with this is to, is um, all three councils are being briefed on, on the content of this paper at the same time, um, yeah. so so that we get we get the alignment um, between the three councils in terms of because essentially what this does is revise the time frame. It just puts it out a bit longer, but it means we're going to get a better product because we're going to have um, young people involved in the design and and the solution. So um, the end point is now, um, as Steve said, is um, early 2023 for a okay. strategy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there will be, there will be um, principles and goals delivered in July 2022, when we're, which we will bring to council and then we'll test it with our community. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I understand. I'll just before I go to the end. Yeah, that was, you want to add anything? Yeah, thank you. Um, when Garrick and I met with the um, officials from Carlton and Marston the other day, and um, Stefan was with us. The um, the overriding issue with this was that there didn't seem to be anything in the paper that gave a reason for doing this. As in, um, you know, what's the objective of this? Um, and so that was really critical because if you don't have an actual objective, what are we doing? Are we just having a talk fest? And with that in mind, we actually need deliverables as well because if we're going to put a lot of money towards something we need to know that we actually have deliverables that are measurable and accountable. And officers who are asking for the money need to be accountable for that. And so yeah. those were the two fundamental things that were missing in the briefing documents that, that we got the other day. Um, that about right, um, Garrick? Yeah, totally agree, yeah. Right, and you have a question? Um, yeah, just a, a point of clarification, uh, since Alice mentioned that there's going to be It's not the first time the local government has met with young people. Um, we met with um, seniors from um, uh, uh, Culinary College for the long-term plan. We had 
very lengthy, good discussions with them, and they fed into our long-term plan. And the year before, we also met with them with regards to our annual plan, and they submitted to that as well. So it's not um, that it's not been done before, it's that hopefully it's going to be much more inclusive in the future. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, and and I do think you're absolutely right. That and I guess that that's why I'm maybe framing it as something that we haven't done so much before. Is that it's this is going to be a, an engagement that reaches into a lot of different communities, young communities in the in the wider upper, and right. having. Carry sorry. Sorry, and having those champions from really diverse groups will really help or really support the outcomes there. What you're basically saying, the detail of this developed over, over time, because what you say, 2023. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of time, a lot of thought to go into this. So, you know, where we are is only a starting point. So, uh, Brenda, you have a question? Thank you. Um, just one quick question. Uh, what assurances will we be receiving that the money is going to be fairly distributed within the South Wire APA? Um, because it's a, it's a big investment for us to actually make with this that I can actually see. Um, how can we guarantee that uh, we actually get a portion of that and it's not just going to the other two councils? Um, sorry, the, the figures that were quoted in here is what we're doing already, Brenda. So the 72... Um, Thousand is what we already administer in South by Rapper, specifically for South Rapper for grants. So the only extra resourcing that's currently contemplated, well, actually, there's no extra resourcing. It literally is um, saves time and what we're already spending money on. So there's nothing new here in terms of. Uh, so I must be a bit confused because you're going into a uh, combined um, council with regards to this. Yeah, but it, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the commitment is literally saves time as a staff member into that. There's no extra funding in this. If the no, no, I wasn't asking about the funding. I was just, just making sure that uh, we as the South Wire Rapper are actually benefiting from this. So is it a benefit? I can probably answer that for cool. you, Brenda. The, the, Thanks, Alistair. The, the arrangement is to have everybody working on the same sheet of music, yep. but each council will be responsible for their own area Fantastic. Um, yeah, so that's we'll what I want. Own money, own money into our own own rank of pay, mm -hmm. but within Excellent. the overall strategy, so we're not doing something different from the other two councils. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Alistair. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Alistair. That's my understanding of it, anyway. So let's clarify it enough, Brenda. Is it okay? Right. We any more questions on this, Alex? Really, no, I'm good. happy with it. Yeah, yeah I have read it. And, you know, I'm pleased that Garrick and Alice were here to give their view on it. So, I, I, the only comment I could make would be that one of the risks that will come out of the strategy is a oh, continuation yeah. of the mill task force yeah. jobs, which is all of a sudden becoming a bit of a contributor in this area, and whether we have to adjust it as time goes on or if the government pulls that strategy. Well, uh, pulls that in the there's no doubt that we will. Yeah. It's a moving beast. Yeah. And, um, so, do I have someone to approve the required approach to review the, and develop the Wairapa Rangatahi development strategy? Garrett and Alex. We all in favour? Aye. Raise your hands. Thank you. Right. Information reports, partnerships and operations, amenities and writing report. Um, which is C1. Uh, do I have someone to move? We receive the report. That will start and I'll second that. We're all in favor. Aye. Right. Well, as the acting group manager, um, partnerships and operations, <laughs> because Stephen's away on holiday um, yeah. and we'll deserve holiday. Um, so we've, we've given you. Um, you recall if you went back um, three or four months ago, Rebecca and a number of the councillors said, we're not getting a lot of information um, around particularly our roading area. You know, so we get a lot of information on the amenities, a lot of information on water, but not, not a lot on roading. So first of all, um, we've split the report into two bits. So you've got a roading and amenities, and then following that will be a report on waters. 
Um, so this is literally um, in the partnerships and operations space. It's literally, as I said, just roading and amenities. Um, the first um, major commentary is, uh, like all of New Zealand, um, the, the roading and any infrastructure, and it includes water, um, is being impacted by COVID, um, not just at the, um, the costs of materials, contracting costs, labour, all those types of things, but literally physically the worst workforce. And we're experiencing the same things ourselves with our team out at Dalefield Road as part of Rimohanga Roads. A number of them have literally um, not been able to work, have been impacted um, because of um, COVID, as have our contractors. Um, so just that was just to really give you a, a heads up that um, despite, and actually I'll just take my hats off to the team, when you look at their physical um, progress they've actually managed to do with the overall work programme, considering the impact on um, our workforce and their ability to deliver these things and costs, it's really reassuring to see the, um, the progress across the whole continuum, um, which you'll see in the, in the report where it's gone line by line through our activities. Yep. Um, we're three quarters of the way through the year. Um, we're, we're, you know, um, despite all that, we're largely on track. Um, and the important things that really matter, um, the critical assets, um, all those types of things, they are being um, being um, worked on and they are being progressed, which is, um, and, and you can see that literally through the, um, the proportion of work that's, that's um, being explained in the various outputs. So um, despite um, a very difficult time, work is progressing, but also, you know, we can't get everything done all at once. And, and so there's the commentary about Hinakura Road, which is not an excuse. Um, we're, we're, we're working on that one really critically. And you will remember, and I do stress, before Christmas, it looked like um, if uh, after the last weather events, we, we, um, we moved heaven and earth, literally, um, to keep that road open. It was a critical time for people with Christmas, with stock, all those types of things. Um, and so, yes, we are slightly behind, um, but we've been able to keep, um, to keep things moving. And um, there's good progress being made, despite what you might read in the, in the media, unfortunately. Um, I think we're, we're really, really doing a good job there now. Um, so there's extensive stuff on the roading, and I'm happy to answer any particular questions around those. But the, in the amenity space, one I do want to draw your attention to, because it actually links to the discussion we'll have further on in the agenda around stock exclusion as it relates to our water races. Um, but also um, in the amenity section on page 18, 4.3, Three, um, it is, is something the council will have to consider how what our approach is to our own properties, you know, pain farm, um, our own leases, and um, how we will manage um, stock exclusion. So um, we draw your attention to that. But um, again, when you when you um, see the presentation from Greater Wellington Regional Council further on in the agenda, um, it's something we can circle back to because um, the issue is not just about our water races, which we manage for, um, for others. But it's also our own land and how we manage that. So um, I think good progress. I think the team been working really hard in a very difficult situation and happy to take any specific questions. I'll take the reporters read. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this one I had on the, uh, the claim for the special purpose road, why is it above what we budgeted for? Was there extra work done on it? Uh, so, sorry, um, JP, do you mind saying that? Does it sound like you're under the, uh, the claim, claim for a special purpose of road? Yeah, the, is above what we budgeted for. Is that because we've done extra work? No, um, so I, I, I um, uh, yeah. no, I'll have to check that with Tim. Um, I'm uh, sorry, 14, yeah, page 14. Yeah, um, JP, so remember, this is um. Just year to date, so we may be ahead of our work program in terms of the budget. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, so so you know, um, so remember a number of these. The, um, so we might have actually done work, you know, when we did the eco reef or whatever it may yeah. be, which will come up later, um, to do do some improvement at the same time we were there, but that be ahead of budget. So a lot of these things, um, you know, what this is really telling you is is, is we're on track to deliver our end of year outturn for our yep. full program. But if you look at the overs and unders, um, you can't do everything at 75% at this time of the year. Yeah. No. So, yeah, so we're on track, basically. Thank you. Uh, Alex. Yeah, uh, Harry, I've got a good one here for you. Um, cycle path maintenance. Is there a Wakako Taki 
allocation for cycleway maintenance? Because it appears that no, there's there's um there's Wakakutahi will um assist with um, footpath maintenance. They didn't used to. They do. Yeah. They, they have done for the last few years. And um, at the cycle path inside a road area, but it won't cover things like the five trails. So okay. it won't. Yeah, which I think is what your question was, Alex. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was just a bit confused. So, there. so it's it's um because I mean the the direction is to try and support alternatives to vehicles. So yeah. the more so that they do will literally subsidise um, cycleways as part of a cycle network and as a, a footpath network, but not um, if you like the, the tourism side yeah. of um, you know, yeah. Tago rail trails that kind of stuff. Well, no, they don't do that. And you also mention about um, emergency funding works for minor events. Yeah. And uh, what's the status on that? Has there been any changes since this report was created? No, no, I, um, I don't think so. Um, but I can, uh, Tim, unfortunately, is away on, on holiday. So um, oh, I've been able to nail him, nail him down. And he has a, a well deserved thing. It, it is still the same as, as we've reported it. So the 100K limit and has to be. Um, you know, literally an emergency. Um, yep. But you know, generally, they're, they're pretty good at responding. Yeah. yeah. Um, on the leases um, that we have, 25 leases, so does that mean that all of those leases have been reviewed with a, an eye to market? Well, I, I'm assuming, I've, I've, I've read it that way, um, Alex. You know, so we're, we're, we're on track to say that all of our leases that are commercial have been yep. assessed at commercial rates, and that's the the number that's the four hundred k, whatever it is, um, and that the the remainder are non commercial leases. They're community good. Oh, good. Thank I you. Think, yeah, I think Katrina was doing something after our last or the previous asset service. Yeah, right. I just wanted to know whether that whole process was complete. Oh, okay. because, yeah, we were slowly working our way through it over the last few years. Yep. So, uh, yeah, uh, the, the way that I'm reading this is it looks it as though we are, yeah, you know, okay. we're there. Which is fantastic, you know. We, as you know, we had Sarah um, Pearson Coates, we've had Olivia, we've had a whole team. Well, not yeah. a team, individuals working on these progressively, and, and that's really reassuring because, as you know, um, when the council started this term, um, we had no idea where our um, commercial leases and things were were at. Um, yeah. And you know, Bryce and the team are to be commended for bringing the, you know to getting on top of all this. Absolutely, Go Colin, and then uh, yeah, um, thanks, Harry. <laughs> Just picked up on your. Um, uh, on your comment about the NZTA funding for cycleways, um, when the Western Lake cycleway between Cross Creek and uh, Featherston was put in place, there was a um, uh, council was advised that there was a, a twenty five thousand dollar a year grant for maintenance. Does that still apply, or is that are you aware of that grant? That no, there? look, I'm I'm not aware. I'd be actually very surprised um, if if. Um, if it is part of a cycle network, remember that was the they started with the um, um, prime, you know, um, John Key, the John Key. Tra there was a uh, there was a right. bucket of money um, yeah. that was around um, national cycle trails and that type yeah. of thing. So I just don't know where that where that was. I have to dig into it, Colin. Okay. Are you talking about government funding for cycleways? You know, NZTA uh, when we put the cycle trail in, it didn't meet the threshold for a um, a signature trail. Um, but uh, when we when we put the trail in, there was a, uh, a an assurance or a guarantee from NZ. That's what we were told yep. at the time that we would receive some funding to the tune of twenty five thousand dollars a year for maintenance of that trail. Only when it becomes the signature trail is what I understand. So it needs to get to that threshold. Of being a signature trail, and then we go. I don't know. It was prior to uh, being yeah. recognised yeah, as a signature trail. Yes. Yeah, so, let me take I mean, it to a Colin. I'll, I'll, I'll certainly be happy to do yeah. that. But I'd be very surprised if Wakatahi yeah. would uh, provide yeah. a, an ongoing maintenance to no. essentially a um, a recreational cycle trail as opposed to an urban. Um, well, we yeah. had numerous workshops creating a business case for that trial to be funded to some extent through yeah. NCT. No, it'd be good, be good. So you good. might have done something brilliant. <laughs> I'd like to know yeah, about that one. Uh, things change, but <laughs> okay. uh, I've discussed this with Rock Kotahi and they said they would only look at contributing if they showed a mode change, right. uh, and which is very difficult to prove when there's 32 Ks to travel from one sure. town to the other. Or yeah. whatever. No. Okay. no, I just picked yeah. up on that with uh, Harry's comment, so I thought I'd yeah. ask the question. No, no, that's a good question, because I mean, remember um, the um, Wakakote's funding priority changes depending on the government direction, on the government of the day, uh, yeah. as you know. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's, yeah. never, there's never an absolute guarantee that's going to continue yeah. into the future ever um, for those types of things. And particularly yes. right now, as Wakakote's got a, 
a funding hole um, because of the reduction in road user charges and um, fuel excise duty. So, you know, that they're prioritising madly to try and keep things within budgets. Yeah, I can see that we we might get some cuts coming, but anyway, that's another thing. <coughs> uh, and you had a... Yeah. Yes, page 20, Great Town Pavilion Parkway. Current meeting with Sports Club, draft designs and work with closing the pavilion while the new build begins, hopefully in March 2023. I have met with Bryce over this, and Bryce informed me that all clubs will need to use the changing facilities in the memorial swimming pool um, in order to, to, to change for their games. Now, the Great Town Community Board has for a number of years indicated that the changing rooms are substandard and that work needs to be done on these. So if we are looking um, to, to use these um, for, for all the clubs, then we really need to do some work those changing rooms. Yeah, well, thank you, Anne, but I'm, I'm not it's a bit of a shame that Bryce isn't here. He could give us a so is, um, can I, I'm, I just didn't quite get what it is, but is Anne referring to the Greytown Pavilion? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's actually reported in here on um, under 4.7. So Greytown Pavilion upgrade. Um, so that Bryce and the team are meeting with sports cars with draft design and working through closing of the pavilion while new build begins, hopefully in March 2023. So um, they're, they're working on it. I think they've had a couple of problems, and in terms of just trying to find people um, able to do works. Um, but is, it, there's, there's a commentary here about getting it. That's, that's on the plan, um, and it's reported. And is there any commentary about where the young people will change in order to, to for their games to proceed? Uh, no, I, I, no, it doesn't say that, but I'll have, I'll have to find out about it. They will be changing in the Great Town Memorial Swimming Pool. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm just highlighting that for them to be able to use that, we really need to do work on those changing things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll wait for that and get some feedback from Bryce. Exactly. Yeah. And just very briefly um, on reports uh, back on Bidwell's cutting. Uh, the pedestrian upgrade, um, how are we with these developments? Because I've had numerous complaints from residents to say that there is no footpath for them to use and no crossing, safe crossing for them to cross over to the medical centre. Harry, you got to speak with Yeah, um, Anne sent me an email about that. I, I forwarded on to Tim, but unfortunately he's on um, holiday, so I can't, I can't give you an update um, at this committee meeting, but we can certainly um, give you an update um, when Tim gets back from leave and um, let you know where things are up to. If we could have an update back to the community board, that would be good. Yeah. Well, yep. I think you've got to bear in mind here and um, Tim and the roading team having trouble. I know Fort Mahogan and some of the contractors are totally understaffed because of COVID. So things are on the back burner a bit, which is unfortunate, but we'll get that updated to you. Well, I don't understand that, but those... Uh, that should have been completed if the medical centre was open because it is a, a hazard and a danger to people who are using the medical I, centre. I understand that, but the medical centre was open before when the, yes. the, um, they came to council. Yeah, well, yeah, I think it's been clearly documented the issues around yes. that. So. Yeah. <coughs> okay, Alison. Yeah, well, thanks, Jeffy. Um, Harry, just a question on our death and serious injuries. Um, so that's uh, on Stella page. Yep. yep. Um, yeah. Look, that, that looks really good, but you know, obviously, any death and serious injury on the road is not great. But um, the annual KPI of seven does that is that um, obviously in line with Waka Kotahi's road to zero strategy and, and, and reducing it over time? And if so, are we feeding into, into them that we we look like obviously one crash away, but looking pretty good on where we are? at the moment um, and, are, and are we going to feed this data into them when they make the decision about the state highway um look they that we get this information from the minister um that they are the ones that own the crash analysis system so they have all this data i mean it's, it's, it's not us collecting it separately to them um, but just be reminded that at, at the at a number like seven it is um all you've got to do one is crash. Have, 
but I know what a van. You know, um, yeah. well, absolutely, people, I, I understand. Three people that. I saw. Yeah. You know, it's it's it's, it's um, yeah, it's. It, it, I mean, look, it's fantastic. But a number like seven in, in an area our size um, is actually statistically. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to minimise the impact that occurs with death and serious injury, but it's um, it's really hard to to um, predict. No, look, I, I I get that. I'm just trying to yep. work out when we're going to hear from Waka Kotahi about what they're going to do. And I've got a, I've got an assumption I know what they're going to do because they've, they've done it all around the country so far. But it's really important because obviously it's going to affect how we do our other roads. And yep. that's... Um, um, yep. And of course, just, that's just more important and, and, and we have had this um, discussion um, previously, is, is Waka Tahi do not use death and serious injury as the indicator for setting speed. Okay, so... That's um, not they, what they said to us. No, no, no. They did. They did explain this. Um, they um, they use a thing called the infrastructure risk rating system, and so it's a predictive model, and it based on um, a dis distillation of what they call Kiwi Wrap, um, and there's um, anchor. It's an international um, standard that looks at the risks inherent. Um, when you're driving. So I think it looks like sight lines, um, curvature, super elevation, camber, um, all those types of things, Num number of driveways entering a road. And um, so they, the, the risk rating for a road that, um, that gives you the, the safe and appropriate speed is based on that. It's, and, and yes, deaths and serious injuries are there, um, but they're not one of the, the significant factors, uh, ironically, because a death or a serious injury can happen anywhere on a network. Um, there's not in a number like seven, um, it will never be the same place twice. You know? And so, if you want to predict um, what, what where your risk is, you look at the the the, um, the road, you look at the its curves, you look at the number of driveways, um, the shoulders, all those physical characteristics, and that's, that's how they drive it. it, it um, and they're the same for the state highways. It, it's not based on deaths and serious injuries. Well, are we going to use that same system then for our own local roads? Exactly, and, and, and there is. I mean, there's there's a tool. But, but that's not that's not what the subcommittee is is looking at using that system because that hasn't even been given to us to look at the roads in that regard. Ask ask that question. You know, um, I, uh, I have explained. You know, I'm, I'm happy to explain that to you. And um, you know, and I do know this one inside and out um, in terms of the um, the factors. Um, and um, this is international best practice, you know, the, um, in terms of the, the standard of the roads. Um, whether we agree with it or not, it, it's a whole different thing, but it, it, that's the science. You know, I'm just explaining there is science behind this, um, but it's not related. Death, if you use death and serious injuries, it's like to predict where lightning strikes. Um, if you want to get a, 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 the rating of the road, the engineering standards that apply um, are in these risk factors. So how do how do we put into into their decision making then um, things like economic impact? Um, well, again, um, if you're talking about economic impact in the terms of the delay in um, travel times, okay, there's um, and we we'll probably took them out. There's actually about um, two or three studies that were done. One was um, what people perceive as um, lost travel time over distance. And the other is what people actually um, experience in lost travel time. And the difference is immense. You know, um, and I'll, I'll give you a perspective on that. On the Waikato Expressway, the, um, the um, Cambridge section, which is 16 kilometres long, people, um, when it was raised from 100 to 110, and um, it was me that did it, um, the perception was people were saving minutes in time. That was the perception that was asked of people, the reality was 13 seconds and the difference between traveling at 100 and 110. So um, and so there is really good science um, and studies that will talk about the difference between what people perceive as the distance in speed versus what the actual reality in terms of change in um, mean speed actually is. And we're happy to dig all that stuff out for you guys. You know, um, it's a bit of my past but um happy to get that point well, I, 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 I'm not I'm not too worried about how the, the car time I'm more worried about the the uh, flow on effect to transport um, and more particularly public transport um, and times that people need to then leave to get somewhere and so on and the and the issue on um, timetabling for buses and so on yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you know because that's that's all going to change 
Um, yeah. Whether we like but, it or not. Uh, but equally, we're already poorly serviced by, by um, public transport as it is in South Wherever. Yeah. Um, look, there, there's, uh, I, we can get that information for um, Alistair. So there, there's, there's really robust studies um, um, that, were, that have been done in New Zealand, not, not um, you know, Sam Charlton um, and, and well, Michael. It would, be, it would be really good to have yep. that information out in the public arena so that people can see it, because at the moment, um, it, it is one um, of the single biggest topics that people raise with me is going, yep. what's going on with the roads and what's happening? And I can't yeah. answer it. No, I'm, I'm happy to talk to NZTA or yeah. what to, to provide that because you know I know they've got it. I'm I'm, yeah, I'm I'm surprised they haven't put it in the public arena. Actually, maybe Harry, that if you can, uh, could follow up on that and get that. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Happy to. Yeah, that'll be great. Uh, Eric, yeah, sorry, um, I'll that's be all right. You in the back there. <laughs> um, Harry, um, Kaki, uh, page twenty. I know we're talking to Heritage New Zealand. Um, just to put it on the table. We had a meeting the other night with um, Fitterson Community Board, um, Heritage Fitterson, Dark Sky, um, lead agency in all this. When I know that from the notes there, it's going to be, there's a discussion about to go on between council and heritage. Um, who is lead agency in that? Is it us? Oh, we are. We are. Um, without well, any doubt, you know. So, yeah. So, um, engaging with people like Heritage Fitterson and. Um, Dark Sky, who was actually leading that? Because so it is, it was, is Bryce, um, you know, so, so um, Bryce and Stephen's team. Um, so, um, you know, and you know Bryce's workloads, he's got stuff all over the place. But um, no, it, is, it, is, it is our decision. Um, so, um, you know, Heritage came through, um, you know, obviously it's a Heritage site, but it goes from everything, just complete, um, just fencing stuff and um, sheltering stuff in situ, right through to a full restoration project. Um, our budgets are only really based on just protecting the um, what what is there right now. Um, if the community wants to invest more, then then, then that's fantastic. Um, yeah, but yeah. ours, is, yeah, I, it's I, accept, I accept all that. The point being that at the moment it looks like it's been run by South Warwick and Heritage, and the community is saying, "Well, hang on, what's our no. role in this?" And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're the we're the um, so the Heritage Museum of Venice. It's an obvious place. We probably should be communicating with them. I'm just yeah. saying. Uh, okay, no other thanks, Garrick. That's actually a good yeah. heads up. You know, we need to we need to explain what our role and who's what whose roles are. That's I'll have, a, I'll yeah. have a chat with Shield and Bryce about doing just that. I, I, I thank you. Well, just before you, uh, Alistair, this needs to be divided into two parts. One is the immediate preservation. Uh, That's right. Of the um, remnants, and the next one is the expansion or rebuilding of a, a tourist attraction. They're quite separate, I think. The immediate part which Bryce is involved in is how do we spend the money to preserve what's there? And you have budgeted a certain amount for that. Yes, too. Yeah, right. so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think when it comes to are we going to turn this into an observation? Ah, uh, yeah. But that's a totally different. Uh, I accept all that. The point being also that Heritage actually do have funding. That's what I'm trying to get to. Sorry, Gary. So, what was the, the comment? Did, um, pardon? Say again. Oh, you've gone quiet, Harry. Okay. So, sorry, Gary. I didn't. Um, sorry, yeah. It is. It is our decision. I mean, it, um, it is a heritage site, um, but it's, it's our decision to what level yeah, we yeah, want yeah. to. Sorry, I'm no, just saying that Heritage New Zealand does have funding, and the feeling was that we should, we as the Featherston community. Could we put in an application to Heritage and say, well, how we actually want to go a step further, uh, but we need to work through South Warwick to do that. That's the point you've just made. Yeah, and, and we're happy to do that. Great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Alistair, do you have another? Have you got your hand up there? Yes, please. Yep. Yeah. our um, Bridge, Harry. So um, obviously you're aware um, that a few months ago there was a meeting by residents on Underhill Road on the Greytown side, the, the rural residents there about their concerns and now obviously on the Featherston side, same same issues have been raised. I am hopeful, fingers crossed, that the Greytown site might be um, might be solved by a very smart suggestion with the water pipe. Um, but we'll wait and see on that one. So but we need to we really do need to get some traction on the safety of cyclists going to use this bridge because I'm assuming they're only a few months away from finishing it. So. Yep. Um, so um... We have we have actually made an application to the um, the tourism infrastructure fund um, to see if we can get some um, financial assistance because um, that is a fund um, that's been um, established by government to fund 
things of this nature, um, not necessarily cycle trails per se, but things that would improve um, tourism um, infrastructure in a, in a district. We've been successful in the past with things like toilets, um, with various things out in the um, in the coastal area. So um, we have made an application, um, and because um, currently we have not budgeted anything, um, as, as you'll be aware, um, to improve that part of the road. So we're and as as being an entrepreneurial as we can to see if we can find an alternative way of, um, of resourcing. Okay. And what's the time frame on that, Harry? Do we know when we? Um, so, uh, well, the applications are closed, so it's in, um, and we haven't. I, I, unless um, I don't, I haven't heard anything um, as yet. I'm not sure, quite sure when they they are required to uh, notify us. But it was the 28th of March, I think, was the date that the applications had to be in. And I know they're in because we I signed them off. Um, so yep, yeah, so they're, they're, they've been made, and um, we look forward to hearing about that. Thank you. I, I have a couple of weak questions, but the more um, what Tim and Bryce starts, but I, I will get in touch with them when they come back from holiday. Now, do we have any other discuss, uh, questions around the partnership and amenities report? Oh, good. Thank you. We shall now move. Sorry, Jeffrey. Um, I suppose. Sorry, Jeffrey. I suppose we probably want to get it out of the public that the um, that the consultation on the or the. The engagement with the community on the skate park or the wheels yes. park in Greytown is now going out and um, it should be out very, if not already. It is um, out. Yep. Good. So people, we, we really Sweet. want to encourage people to give their feedback on it. Um, yeah. This is this is not consultation as to say I don't like the park or whatever. This is more about what they would like to see in the park as opposed the to the design. location or the design. You know, it's. Um, um, is that yeah, made um, clear that that is. The consultation was, Harry, some engagement. No, so, um, again, um, you'll recall last time I've been very specific. Consultation will occur in relation to the resource consent um, once you have a design and how it affects the immediate neighbours, and they'll be concerned about noise and various things like that. So that's um, that's an RMA consultation, and that will occur in, in due course. This is literally a just um, engagement. So, so yep. we're doing this. Um we did our consultation about whether we should do the, the park, um, et cetera, in the LTP. So we've done that. This is literally what does it look like, what what look and feel do you want, what um, features do you want, all those types of things. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. This, this has been widely done through Greytown for a couple of months now, and it's going out to the other two towns to say, you know, some, some of the money is going into this, so this is what it looks like. Um, give, us, give us your feedback on it. Um, yeah, exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. But it is a short, a short period because we want to get on with it. Thank you, Alistair. Brenda, you got your hand up there? Yeah. Um, thank you. Hey, Al, um, question for Alistair. Um, so um, is a consent required for the, the skate park? Um, yes. Cool. And so um, I take it that if it is, if it is um, required, then it's a public notified uh, I'll hand that's that on to Harry. That's, that, that's a different thing. Um, so um, it, it, um, it depends on... So the district plan sets things like noise levels. Um, <laughs> so theoretically, if the noise levels do not exceed um, the boundary of the park itself, then it does not require any form of notification. Um, so, But that's an assessment you make on once you've got the information before you and you have to do things like sound tests and then it, a lot of it depends where for instance some of the um, the features are located so you know if they're right up against a boundary of a property you can bet your bottom dollar that um, that would be um, have an effect on the adjacent property if they're at the other end of the, the site not near a problem um, property then um, they may not have any effect at all so it's a case-by-case -case consideration Brenda. Mm, cool excellent yeah. um, I love the idea Alistair that you're actually taking out to public uh, for for some feedback, so that's, that's really good. It, it has been it has been um, designed with um, consultation with with Kurunui College and um, Greytown School, for example. Um, a lot of the different clubs and organisations within Greytown, obviously, because it's a, within the Greytown area. But now that they've they've settled on what they would like to see in it, uh, Tim's obviously done a hell of a lot of work um, in the design for the roading and stuff around the around the entrance way to. Um, the, the cycle yeah. trail out to the out to the railway line and um, the dog park and so on. So all that's been completely incorporated into actually really develop that area into something that that is useful for 
all ages, really. Sounds great. Thanks. I'd just like to add, I think it was one of the, as Alistair was saying, and the councils would say, I think one of the highlights of the LTP um, submission process and um, community hearings was the number of young people who came and talked to us about um, what, the, how, what the value they saw and some of the issues and opportunities. I thought that was really exciting. Thanks, guys. Right, if there are no more questions around that uh, report, we'll move on to scene two, which is the Partnership and Operations Water Report. Um, if someone would like to move, we receive that report. Um, just um, before you move, oh, so Jeffy, I've just got a correction to make to the report just before. Um, so, well, you receive it and then I'll just make the correction. Yep. So it's not in the minutes. Alex, yeah. no. okay. Um, Alex yeah. has got his hand up too. Yeah. He's, he's second in that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're all in favour of that. We're seeing Thank you. Um, right, now, Harry, that correction. Um, yeah, so um, the correction is on page 44 of the actual report. I'm not sure what number that is in Stella, where it reports, um, where, where there is a table that reports the costs of the Featherston wastewater, yep. and it cites um, the number six. 666285 for land purchase, yeah, which included the Holler Farm, the um, Featherston Golf Club, and a, and a small block for um, Longwood West. That figure should actually read um, 59061674. Okay, so um, good old Colin, well spotted. Um, so that's the, the land purchase that's reported in the report is not accurate. The correct number is 59061674. But we, it's a level of detail, but I just want to correct the, um, the public record on that. And we'll come to that as we go into the report. Okay, thanks. Look, um, I'd like to welcome uh, the Wellington Water team, Tanya, Linda, Adam. Uh, there? Adam. Yep. Uh, uh, I, uh, just... Thank you so much. I'd just also like to note, as per Harry's team, we're really rather short of people as well for school holidays. But <laughs> those of us that are here will attempt to answer as much as we can. Thank you. Um, um, Jeppy, before we start, I'd like to make some opening remarks, if I may. Yep. On the report. Um, I think um, I just want to say, um, and I want to commend Wellington Water on the um, level of detail and um, the information that is provided in this report. It is um, comprehensive, and even though some of it's a bit hard to read when you get to the um, the landscape pages, um, there's some incredible information in here about what progress has actually been made across a wide range of fronts. Um, and um, also, it also gives an indication of some of the, um, the work that isn't just in fixing stuff. It's about knowing what our asset condition is, what our um, critical assets are. Um, and also, there's a whole lot of stuff in here about innovation in terms of technology, you know, little, little creepy crawly things that suck out and clean up reservoirs and, um, you know, and, and ways of actually um, containing cost. Um, because we've got some scale across the whole region. So um, I just want to, Tonya, I just want to, um, you know, I haven't dived into the detail of these things for a while because obviously Stefan's been looking at it. But when, when I read through this last week, I thought, holy, this is really good. Um, you know, this is something, um, I, you know, and I say that quite genuinely, we, we would um, never have had this understanding of what our assets um, and some of the innovation um, when, when we're doing this ourselves. We just, we just, just wouldn't have. Um, and so I think there's, there's actually some fantastic information here, particularly when you look at the fiscal stimulus funding, what we've been able to achieve in that, um, particularly for Featherston, actually. Um, you know, that's the, um, you know the, the, um, the asset renewal program in Featherston has, has been the bulk of the stimulus package. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to enjoy listening to your report and I hope, um, you know, councillors, um, I'm sure they've read it. And um, there's some great stuff in here. So, look, well done. Okay. On behalf more. of the team, thank you, Harry. Yeah, I'd just also like to welcome uh, Simon Cartwright here from Southern Cross Consulting. He's uh, He'll be on hand to speak to any of the appendices, so welcome, Simon. Hello, everyone. Right, now we get on to the report. Councillors, any questions? Garrett? 
I'm sure oh, Gary cares. I'm sure Gary cares. <laughs> well, I, was, I was just waiting if you want to go for the first part because I'm only, my, most of my questions are directed to the uh, Featherston um, wastewater proposal. So if there's any other proposals coming through, Okay, before we get onto that, Garrett, then before you get onto that, can we, Tanya, can you just give us an update of where, because this report's a week old now, how are we looking with Tiranikau um, repair? I um, don't have Tim here, but he sent me through a photo early today. It has the repair has been affected. Um, in his words, the bolts need tightening and the backfill needs to go in over the remainder of the week. So that is now done. So we're out of the woods on that, which is fantastic. So I'll send that photo through to you, Harry, and you can share it with the councillors. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great news. Yeah, Tanya, on that, do we um, you have a figure on how you've gone to budget-wise? I knew you were going to ask that straight away, but <laughs> no, I'm not. Sorry. But we will. Yeah. I've lost you. Yeah, we will. Once the work has been completed, we'll be able to get that figure to you. Oh, that would be great. But no big issues during the um, uh, implementation. There was there were delays because of the access, and I think we've shared that with you at yeah. the webinar. And there were also delays due to the to the river flow. Um, where it kept raining when it wasn't convenient. Um, so the the team had to wait through that, but other than those um, relatively small delays, they're all good. Thanks. Okay, that's good. Right, Gareth, we're back to you, mate. Okay. Well, actually, before, sorry, before we go there, can we just, um, just um, the Boar Bush Reservoir? Um, yeah. I, just, um, I think, you know, this is this is that piece of infrastructure um, led to the Boar Water Notices in, um, in Featherston. And so, you know, this is... Uh, how um, assured are we, Tonya, that um, that this isn't going to fill up with water again? Um, you know, so in terms of the leak fixing and that kind of stuff, is this is this a, a good fix? Do you think? I um, do you know what? I haven't I haven't talked to the people who've done the fix yet, Harry, to see of what extension of the asset life has been given to it. But they um, they are assured that if this, if the same event occurred, then it wouldn't fill up. Um, oh, however, as you know, it's an old, it is an old asset and it was, it is on the list for replacement, but I don't know how much of extension of life we've had out of this um, okay. process yet, but it's a good question. Can I take that away? Yeah, yeah no, please do. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Gary, can you finish? Uh, you wanna... We'll just go through more. Before we get on to Feathers, yeah, 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 um, so I think we are, we've reviewed, Wellington Water's reviewed the line that comes in from Waiahine, uh, apart from the river crossing to make sure it's secure. I know that we've had some slips up there uh, on Bullbush Gully Road. Yes. But we're confident that it, uh, the, those slips are not going to affect the uh, line the in, in line coming in or out. Well, the, that, um, that pipeline was replaced a couple of years ago, actually, I'm looking at Gary because he was involved in that, and it was put on the other, on the far side of the road. So yep. if the road does keep slipping, then there is that it does increase that risk. Um, but we are having to work with the roading team at South Wairarapa on what we actually do there and when. Yeah, we, we shifted the, um, the over that weekend, <clears throat> we, we shifted the pipe out of trouble to the other side of the road. Uh, but in the long term, you need to do somewhere to stabilise the, uh, the the road. Or to um, to shift further uh, away from it um, if if you want to abandon that road and you'd, you'd have to realign the road if you that, that's the other option. So uh, I think it's quite a bit of work to 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 um, uh, to deal with that embankment. It's it's a big embankment and the yeah. I know the stream uh, the, the flows get up really high up there. So uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, but the pipe that is currently suspended through the um, erosion of the road is no longer used, or is that still used and, and needs supporting? No, no, that's abandoned. Decommissioned, yep. Oh, great. That's great. So the pipe's four metres, you know, it's on the other side, literally on the other side. I've seen photos of it. It's on right on the other side of the road. So it's yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Safe, safe as houses. Cool. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Tom. Just a quick question on um, a long-term solution for the Taranika pipe. Um, have you started that work at all, or have you... Um, is this yeah, yes. 
yeah, we, we'll we'll be able to come back to you at the end of May with uh, with, with some options. The end of May. Yes. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Alice, have you had your letter or have you pulled it down in a hurry? No, for pulled it down, I found the answer I was looking for. Okay, great. <laughs> right, on the front part of this report, we're all friends for that because we've got Gareth who's got some burning questions. Oh, not so much burning. I just start off by uh, acknowledging the work of of the uh, operation guys at Lake Water. They've done a fantastic job with this bloody awful weather, as we all know. So, full marks. Man. My concern is when I read through this report um, that uh, it appears to me um, that we're actually looking at a long-term and a short-term consent, which is going, which to my mind, is back to what we did back in 2017. Now, I'm concerned that we're actually sort of rewinding the clock and going back. We've actually added, there's no real detail about what the proposal is going to be. Uh, we all know that 2017 and the 2019 uh, we're both unsuccessful. Um, I think we need more meat on the sandwich, you know, before we can actually take this thing back to anybody. I'm also very concerned um, how uh, I'm going to present this sort of document to the to the Featherston community and say, I'm sorry, we've actually been playing with this for five years and we're now back to the original uh, 2017 proposal. So that's one concern. The other one was I'm just going through and looking at the total expenditure, and I take your figures, Harry, thank you, of the 5.9 mil. Um, there's also a figure of 2.637 mil, which was the cost of consents up until 2017. Um, so we're looking down the barrel again of another 2.5 mil in consents. I'm just nervous that we've actually not really advanced at all, and I don't, I'm not convinced that we've actually got a new solution on the table. And I'm wondering what, what your views are going forward to two new consents, one with a 10-year life period and then one with a 20-year life period. Technology is changing. Uh, and I'm, I think we could actually end up you know, buying a black box, which is actually out of date when the new regulations come through. And I take on board what Simon's doing. I'm very pleased to be looking at something new going ahead. Uh, but at this stage, we really have nothing new on the table and we have no detail and no costs and to my mind, we're still looking at a consultation program to be held uh, on whatever this is going to be. Can I also put in there that I get sort of a bit lost when discussions take place that councillors aren't involved with? Um, the December meeting, I've got no idea what happened at the December meeting. I've got no idea what the shortlist was. Uh, that never came to councillors, it's never been discussed. And we now have before us a short term and a long term consent for something of which I've got no idea about and neither of my community. Great for any enlightenment. Okay, so um, let, let me um, start. Well, can I hear what one water has to say? I mean, I, you know, I'm talking to one from water. They're the people who put this up. They are the consultants. And I just... Oh, yeah. and never, never, never. Let me have a crack at it, or would you like to lead in, Harry? Because Harry's... Um, uh, uh, um, Gary, Gary oh, with, res okay. with respect, they, um, they, are, um, they are agents. We are the principals. We call the shots, you know. And so, um, you know, so, so the, if, you, if you start from the top, um, so the reason we have to go for both a long-term and a short-term consent is that we are operating on an expired consent. It is expired. Um, and we have to... We are operating on extension from um, greater GWRC, um, and which expires in 2023. So um, they've made it really, really clear that they're not going to give us a further extension unless we, um, A, clean up. We do two things. One is that we work on the long-term consent, but we improve the discharge currently into Donalds Creek. And they've made that very, very clear. Um, and so um, and so that we have to run a parallel process. Um, otherwise, we will um, we face the risk of Greater Wellington Regional Council not um, allowing us to operate. And I know, you know, you, know, Adam, you can say, well, what are they going to do? Stop us from discharging water, but you know, legally. Um, they can prosecute us. There's a whole lot of things they can do, and actually that they did with um, Palmerston North. Um, and so, 
um, as the regulatory authority, um, they are telling us that we have to do a parallel process. We have to do best endeavours to, to find a long-term solution, but we must improve the discharge into um, Donalds Creek now. And so that, that's why we're so running... Have, have they given us a, a, an actually defined thing and say, you do this, it is acceptable? No. Well, no. what are we doing then? How do, how do we know what we're even looking for if they well, haven't that, given us an outcome? That's the point of this discussion is saying this is um so this is what we're proposing to be to do um and, and we're trialing various things as you can see in here so we can go to gwrc and say this is what we're doing and then what we're trying to do with GWRC is where's the, where's the point so what what is the improvement what, what, you're looking for just hang on let, let uh harry answer garrett's question and then we can get on to yours yeah, so, um, so you know, the million-dollar question is what is the level of improvement that GWRC would like to see in Donald's Creek? And that's what we are working with them to do. This is what we're proposing to do some of these trials so we can actually see what an MVBR can actually produce in terms of particularly ammonia, um, which is the effect of nitrates inside the stream. You know, so, so we're, not, we're not talking hypothetical stuff here. We're actually putting our money where our mouth is to trial different technologies so we can actually say with some certainty to GWRC actually you know uh, with having done this trial if we plug this technology in, and scaled it this is the improvement we can actually get. Harry right. sorry we've been looking at this for three years now um, and I really wonder why we've gone back there, there was never there was never a short long-term consent in the proposed consents that came out under option 1, 1B7A uh, there was nothing in there about long and short-term consents. We've now all of a sudden got this new thing on the table about long and short-term consents. Um, the the short-term consent previously was five years. But, um, Garrick, Garrick, what changed is we withdrew our still consent. Still so we withdrew our consent application. So, yeah. so, um, so GWRC, as a regulator had um you know had, had um they were going through you know we were going through a process of trying to obtain a resource consent which we subsequently found out we would not have been granted so we, we would have we've spent 2.8 million on uh, that consent which we made the sensible decision to withdraw and subsequently we know it would even if we'd kept on going down that track we would not have had it granted so um, it was a very wise move to pull that consent and save the ratepayers a huge amount of money. You know, I'm that's not, only the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I'm not disputing that. I'm saying if we go ahead with two more consents, we're looking at the thick end another $2 million. And it was once again with nothing, no light at the end of the tunnel. This has not come to the council. It's not come to the committee. And we're looking at the, and there's no detail in this paper telling me what's actually going to happen. So, yes, I take the point that we need to actually put a consent through. Um, but there's no detail here. I, there's no detail about what we're going to do. And with Garrett, that, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm, 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 where we were three years ago. It's, no, four, five, 2017. Again, um, so when we came to the council last year and around February, um, but having done the multi-criteria analysis and doing all that work to narrow it down to four options, the option or six options, whatever they were at the time, they were unaffordable. Um, and we had doubts whether they were consentable. Um, and so there's no way we wanted to, um, as councillors were, wanted to commit council to something, A, that may not be consentable, and B, is unaffordable to our community. We never, um, so, we never consulted on four. And then I heard that, that four, which was delivered in August, went away and came back. I don't know what happened in December, because that was a secret meeting. I have no idea what's being considered. Not a clue. Garrick, Garrick the, um, sorry, again, with respect, the, the secret meeting is council officers are responsible for putting the information in front of council. The, um, if we think there's not sufficient information in the report, um, for you guys to make an informed decision, then and we're not going to put a report up. Um, so we've been sitting so, on that since December, and now we're into April. Oh, okay. Look, I look, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling a bit confused about because we have, you know, we've had a workshop. I'm just worried about the amount of money that's been put into this exercise, and we don't know what we're talking about, and we have no, no. Solid so, 
So, Gary, what what is it that we don't know that we're talking about? So, what what you have in, in your report is um, quite a specific program of work around what we're going to do um, to obtain, um, particularly a short term consent. So, we meet um, the requirement because the biggest risk that council faces right now is that we have a extension that's been granted to us by GWRC to operate legally. And so the priority, you know, by any um, any any good judgment, is to operate legally and make sure that we can do that. And so what we're saying to you is a way that we can do that, having discussed it with GWRC, um, which I've warned you about. You know, with, um, is that we need to run a parallel process. We need to obtain a short-term consent that improves the quality of discharge to Donalds Creek, and we have a program of work in front of you. This says this is what we're going to do. Well, Tom, <clears throat> Tom, can you uh, give us any update of where you are and what variations you're looking at? Well, we're, we are at, at the same point we've been in for a while, and that is we, we're looking for council to support the work going forward. With Harry, we, we, we got to a rock and a hard place last year, didn't we? The, the four options that were put up were extraordinarily expensive. They were, they were two of them, we think, definitely would have been consentable, but they were, they were very expensive, expensive for a council this size. So decision was made to go back and look at what alternatives there, there were, and we've had that conversation, and then Harry and Colin and I and Stefan went to see with equivalents at GWRC to say, how do we get through this in a way so the rate payers of, of the South Water Upper are able to afford something that gets us a consent and just gets us through where we can look at other technologies or look forward for, for a long-term consent for a big wastewater treatment plant or what the other options are there. So that, that was the meeting that was had. The short-term consent option lifts the pressure off having to commit to, to those big expensive treatment plants now. And so the, the plan is in front of you. Simon's part of that plan. And then we've spent, uh, GHD have gone and looked at what other small pieces of work are there that we can do in order to get a short-term consent from the Wellington Regional Council. And that is the program that's in front of you here. Um, hey, Alison, uh, Alice, uh, um, I'd, I'd look after this discussion on what get Simon to give us his views, but Alice, yeah. you go first. The, the, you know, thanks, Tanya and Harry, you, but you raised two really important questions for me on this. Um, one of them, hopefully, will you'll be unanswered because it just it strikes me that we are looking for the Holy Grail and we don't know where to look because Greater Wellington Regional Council, and you use the term, Harry, improvement. Well, what is improvement? You know, Greater Wellington Regional Council is full of scientists and they can tell us what improvement is. And if they tell us, then that leads you down a particular path. And from no document I've seen has said, what is the quality of water that they will allow to be discharged? So it just strikes me as we're going, will this do? Will this do? Will this do? And every time we do that, costs money. Um, so that's point one. Can I get, one. Can I get that, Harry? Can I yep. answer it, Alice, so I don't forget yep. your question before you go on to the next one? You're right. What, what Greater Wellington Regional Council tell us what to do is the quality of water that comes out and where it goes. The thing that we need to work out ourselves is how do we get the inputs of the water that we have and turn it into those outputs? And that's the tricky thing. Have, have they given you, you a specific quality? They can. They will. Yep. And they want, they want, they want, At least yep. that's, a, that's a point that actually then tells you where to look. Because if it's, if it's not right. specific, that, how, how do you know what you're looking for? Yeah, so... so Two ways of doing it. We, we've got you four options for large wastewater treatment plants that do that. We can't afford them. So then we're going back to see what we can get for less money. And that we, that's where it gets a little bit greyer. Okay, but we that, need to that start. And that's why Simon you know, yeah. producing a trial yeah. is a great way to start, right? Well, see, I, th I think we're putting the cart before the horse, actually, because the second part of my question um, is um, what is affordable? And there's been no discussion around the table from councillors. What we, you know, we haven't given you a budget. We haven't told you this is what we as a community can afford to do. Because, and I know Harry, you're bloody ringing your head, go, what a silly question. But actually, it's a really pertinent question because um, 
at this stage, nobody is saying government's going to come to the party and give us any money. So we have to actually say, what is it that we can actually afford within the South Wairapa District Council? And that will then steer you in it. So if you put those two things together, one is the output of water quality and the other one is what's your budget? Because you've yeah. got neither of those things. It, no, no, we have that, Alistair, because in the, your long-term planning process, you put $16 million into the budget for this. That's for the whole thing. But, it's, you know, you've already spent $2.5 million or $3 million, whatever it is, going forward, and we haven't, we haven't got anything. So we, we really need to actually say, you know, that's a, that's a finite figure because, you know, our population is not huge. Um, and, you know, I just, I just, it just really worries me that Wellington, Greater Wellington aren't, factoring into the into the equation the size of the community and how much money there is out there because i know that as a scientist i could just go this is what we want but it's actually not even achievable because of the money so so steering so alistair this is a it is a it is a delicate dance with greater wellington regional council and they are being cooperative so um just starting from the top they are the regulator Right. They are the regulator. So um, when we, right now, we're at that fortunate stage of being in pre-application. We haven't made an application of resource consent. So they can give us unfettered scientific information about um, water quality, all those types of things. But they have to work from our data sets. They haven't got data sets in Don's Creek and that type of thing. So we've done the, done the um, you know, the background water quality um, of Donald's Creek, we've done the um, ammoniacal loading, nutrient balances, um, water tape. That's all the stuff we did in the last consent. So we, we give them the information so they can make an assessment. I don't understand how Wellington Water has to do all that. Surely any discharge to a water body in New Zealand has a specified thing. Ah, no, that's, <laughs> this is, no, 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 this is exactly it. And this is, um, you recall when we had this um, discussion around the three waters early on, one of the things we were advocating was a national environmental standard for wastewater discharge. And there is yes. not one. Okay, well, so there how, is well, not how, how is one. It, how can Wellington Water then ever get to the end of this process if they don't know what the end of the process is? Because the agreement end, with that, GWRC, by working with Greater yep. Wellington Regional yep. Council to get the consent and get them signed up to the processes that we put forward, to treat the water. But they're not accountable to anyone, so they can change the playing field as they go. No, 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 no that's not true. They're accountable to the Environment Court. Yep. So any decision, any decision on any consent is appealable to the Environment Court, um, and an Environment Court works on a de novo basis. So they start from scratch as a check on lay decision-making. So, but it, look... Long story short, because we go around this in circular mm -hmm. argument, is, is um, there are no env national environmental standards. Um, so it is a case-by-case -case decision to depend on the receiving environment. Greater Wellington Regional Council have no information other than what we give them about what the nature of that receiving environment is. So and the do, nature they, do, they have, do they have a receiving environment based on the Wairapa, for God's sake? Because no, it, all ends up, no, it all ends up in the same body of no, water. No, they just... No, they don't. So how, how, do they grant, how do they grant Carterton's consent then? Because Carterton went, went through exactly... You, you, what you do is you... Um, a consent process requires you to um, develop what they call an assessment of environmental effect. So you look at the regional plan and you look at the um, contaminant streams um, and the issues in the regional plan and you basically compile an assessment of environmental effect which basically says how do we avoid, remedy or mitigate those effects. And on a case-by-case -case basis... Um, GWRC um, get a hearing um, committee because it's you know it's public notified. It goes through submissions, and um, then it's all, then the evidence is weighed, um, and so that's the process of consent. As it is, unfortunately, it's not a standard. It's not like water okay, um, so, water quality actually. Okay, so, but the, but the logical issue here is that every bit of water from the Wairapa, whether it be Masterton and Carterton or South Wairapa, ends up in the same place. So how can there be differing standards between the three councils? Um, so, again, in the RMA, um, what the regional council do is they, they do have to limited information through the water systems around certain things, okay? And there's a principle called derogation, which doesn't allow a consent to be um, issued that actually derogates someone else's responsibility to be able to exercise something else down a river system or attachment. And so, look, it's, it's, it's really... But, um, Alistair, in a long story short... 
this is not a simple process. You know, so in the process of um, developing your sense, the scientists that you need and that you have paid for, the hydrologists, soil scientists, um, liminologists, um, et cetera, et cetera. Linda can tell you how many science, more doctors than, than you, you, because of this. You know, you've got to provide the evidence about the, um, the impact on water quality, um, fish species, um, plant species, macroinvertebrates. Um, you've got to do sediment, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, you know, and blah, 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 blah. You need experts for that. And, and so that, that's where your cost is. That's where your cost actually is, is improving the, what the characteristics of the receiving environment are and what the impact of this particular activity is in, in terms of that environment. If it's a, um, a major impact, um, then you've got to show how you're going to mit that, mitigate that or avoid it or remedy it. And, and that's that's what the process is. So it requires dollars, well, scientists. I'll make, a bet, I'll make a bet with you, Harry, that we'll still be in the same situation in three yeah. years' time. Yeah. Can, I, Harry, can I ask how come the hotter farm was taken out um, and... The number of people, including yourself, said, no, we can't touch the hotter farm because the ground levels, groundwater's too high. Now we are back looking at using hotter farm. Can you, somebody explain to me what happened between last year and this year? Because when we talked to GWRC, um, I, you know, the question the council had, was it consentable? Um, there was never any, and, 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 and I never said, and I hope I never gave the impression that it was never consentable. I've always said I'm really, really concerned about whether it can be consentable. There's two different things. When I talked to GWRC, that when Tonya um, was alluding to with the, with the, um, the chief executives, I said, you know, well, I just need to know, is, is, is this land totally hopeless and are we pushing the review bill uphill, or is it possible? And they say, well, actually, unfortunately, we don't have enough information to tell you that. Right? We, we spent two and a half million looking at that land, and, and we were told that, oh, I mean, this week it's consentable, last week it wasn't, sorry. No, yeah. Gary, with respect, you know, we've said, we said we've got extreme reservations about whether it is consentable. I don't think we've ever said that it's not consentable. So, so um, you now we're looking to buy more land. There's a, there's a lot of science that's been done on that land, um, yeah. even back in 2017. So surely that must uh, have had, had some impact on um, on decision making. I mean, goodness gracious, we're, we're reinventing the wheel. The science has been done, and that's that's it. so that's why it is not. Uh, um, so when you look at the money that we've spent, that money is still. Um, uh, the, the, uh, of the 2.8 that we spent on the last consent, there's $700,000 of that that was written off. And that is to do with legal fees and project management costs. The rest of that 2.1 million is assets, which is um, the science, the, um, all that information. We're not yeah. repenting that. Was that We're science using... wrong? Is that what you're saying? That science was wrong? No, I'm saying it's, 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 that's fine. You know, um, and, so, and, we, and we, we're using just that. I mean, it's, it's something that we don't have to pay for again. We're going back now looking at the, the existing site um, for opportunities for discharge in council-owned land. We've already done that. Tyler, can you... Uh... So I'm not sure. I'm, Garrick, what's your question? I'm sorry, I'm not questioning what yeah, you're... So if, if there's a question, can I... The yeah, question, I think, can I, can I clarify the question, Garrick? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In your report, we say there that, you know, we're going back to look at land-based treatment uh, and disposal and see what the limitations on existing um, council owned land are. For the short... So the, remembering there's, there's the short-term consent which is a, is a workaround. Um, and then there's the long-term consent, which, which brings into play, you know, the uh, greater level of treatment. Linda, are you able to talk through the, the two pieces of land and the work that's been done there? Yeah, I think what I'm hearing, Garrick, is, um, so, sorry, Councillor Evans, is some concerns around what, what's been conveyed around the land. So when we talked about the land not being suitable for a full-time discharge, it's talking about the full volume of the outputs of the treatment plant. And so there's concerns with the science 
um, what the science tells us, that the land's not able to support a full-time discharge all of the time. And so you'd need substantial storage and then the ability to, to, to drain that storage to still discharge it. What we want to do with this trial is to have some real life tests to understand what the land can and can't take and how it can be managed. So the difference there is that we're talking about a combined discharge. So some would go to land, some would go to water and we'd want to see what's actually capable. And you'll see in that um, document that th there's the um, facility, I guess, to expand that trial um, as it's going. So we can understand from real life experience what, what we're capable of, what we can utilize, what, what the land can take and then upscale it um, if and as required. It's uh, trying to ma maximize the assets we already have. Yeah, uh, cool. Um, one thing. With, will, with the creation of Taramata Arawai, are they going to have any influence on uh, discharge quality or is it still under the, the Ministry for the Environment? No, that's um, so um, that, that's still under the Regional Council. So the Tamata Arawai uh, are not going to put in a different standard in a year's time with regards to wastewater treatment? No. Cool. Um, the, the next question is that if you have a short-term consent, what work is being done with regards to other lower cost solutions that may have been introduced around New Zealand with regards to their applicability to the South Wairapa? Well, um, we've got we've got some material on that, and I wondered is this the point for Simon to you, to start with what you're trialling, and then Linda can kind of lay out some of the other examples that we've got on the GA. You know, when we gave this request to GHD, to what else can we do for a smaller amount of money? We could have a bit of a chat about that. Is that all right? So that's why you need the short term consent in order to do the longer term analysis of better, or sorry, more affordable options. <clears throat> Yeah, that, I mean, that's right. I mean, there's two, there's two things that we're actually physically trialling. One is literally trialling the absorption in the soils. Um, so um, that, that, and that's the crucial <laughs> thing here. Um, and the second one is, is the MBBR technology, which only contains one contaminant stream. And so that's why there's multiple things in here. But look, let's go to Simon. And, um, Simon, your thoughts? Okay. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, look, <clears throat> I'm going to start off by... Um, just expressing, I guess, what Councillor Palermo has, has picked up on is the uh, the process. It's it's all down to the RMA process. There's no standard for discharge to any water body. Every case is argued. And uh, <clears throat> it's very frustrating within the industry because um, as treatment requires an engineering solution, engineers need a, a target of what they've got to build to. So it's, it's not unique for Featherstone, it, it's throughout New Zealand and um, <clears throat> not having targets to build something to makes the process very long-winded and difficult. Uh, it's something we're not going to solve on this site um, and I think a collaborative agreement and uh, process with the Regional Council really helps um, to come to an agreed solution. Um, <clears throat> another point on that is with the that they, they've raised a number of times is they talk about a best practicable solution, which takes into account the affordability that the community, um, <clears throat> any community can has a limit to what they can they can pay out. So within the um, I guess the solution that the regional council will accept in terms of nutrients going to uh, to be disposed of, then that best practicable solution can be uh, can be part of that. Um, so, having said that, I mean that's that's that applies in a short term or a long term um, solution to the problem. Um, I think the approach at the moment is uh, the council has a bucket of money and. Um, we're already behind the eight wall in finding a solution and doing something that will not only appease, appease the regional council, but also the, the ratepayers and other stakeholders to show that at least with some improvements and hopefully good improve, you know, a lot of improvements are being made quite quickly. <clears throat> when I say quite quickly in terms of, a, of the overall long-term consent. 
So the short term consent, we're looking at um, a various, um, I guess, high tech, high tech, uh, low tech sort of options and combinations of using what we've got on site to to make the best use of that and bolting on some some technology <clears throat> that will really improve the final effluent um, and, and make it acceptable um, to discharge to water. Um, what the regional council have said in many occasions is they're looking at an effects-based um, result. So we, we can only, I guess, um, apply for an effects-based results if we know what we've got now and how we can improve that to predict what we can have at the, as the final solution. So I think Harry's already talked about the data that's been collected and paid for with previous um, studies on the condition of the stream and so on. <clears throat> um, so we, we, we should have a starting point um, now with the trials we're running, which is just one technology, there are others out there, but the trial of this MBBR will give us a real, um, real data that can be scaled to a point where we can be confident in the results of or the quality of the final effluent. And we can then go to the regional council and say, we know what we've got in the creek at the moment. And through these trials, we can be very sure of the final effluent that we can um, put in after improvements. Um, therefore, the, the effects are going to be this. And they're all improvements, in fact, improvements on nutrients and improvements on flows, if we address the I and I issues and so on. <clears throat> so to that end, we have a pilot plant set up and in being uh, operated at the moment. It's going to take a couple of weeks before the um, biological uh, biofilm and so on is formed within that process. Um, and we're well on the way. We got that going before Easter, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so that we could, um, we're, we're trying to fast track it, if, basically. Um, that trial will run for a couple of months and we'll be taking samples of wastewater coming in and going out over the two month period so we can get a real idea of what this sort of technology can give us. Um, we're looking at this technology because it is established. It's effective. Wellington use it at, uh, for Wellington City, um, and it's it works well. Um, so, I think I don't know. Do we have a video we can show at the moment? Um, Excuse me. Yeah. There is a video linked up somewhere, so at least you can see what we're talking about. It's a small small unit. They're only small tanks. But, um, Could I suggest that we get that video? Could it be sent to us? The work of our own, in our own time. Um, I can't oh. control the technology. I don't think so. Oh, uh, maybe. No, I Hang on, Amy said you can share it. I've given sharing permissions on Zoom, so if you've got share screen, you should be able to play it on your screen and share that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was set up um, some by someone already. So. Brenda, I will get to you soon. Set your hand up. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, Anna, um, <laughs> might have to give me a moment to find this because I wasn't. Um, I, wasn't <laughs> I thought it was set up for me. Um, well, Brenda, is there a question you can ask while Simon is running all that Yeah. Um. Thank you, GP um, Councillor uh, Gibson. Um. Just two questions. How much is it? What is the cost of the short-term resource consent? And what is the cost of the longer term resource consent? So the um, oh, we go here. So we, we've capped the short term consent at sixteen million, 
Um, so, and that's in the in the report. So, um, and that's what we put into the long term plan. Um, so, you know, that that's yeah. So, whether that's exactly the right amount, too much, too little, we don't know until we get started. Um, but um, that's that feels that feels reasonable. Um, and that's a discussion we had at the long term plan stuff. We don't know, you know, the the, the figures. Um, we know we cap out in terms of um, Alistair's question about affordability for us in terms of our um, borrowing limits um, and those types of things around between 30 and 40 million. And any, anything beyond that, this council cannot afford. Um, so, so the, I'm not quite sure if you got my question, Harry. How yeah. much is it costing for a resource consent? Of not resource. How much is, how, I wasn't asking how much the solution is going to cost. Oh, okay, just how the resource consent. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, that I don't know. We just don't know. We're, we're working within the budgets we've got now. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's what we've, what we've currently budgeted, and I'll, I'll have to check what that amount is. Well, and it, Brenda, it's, it's a really good question, but it's very difficult to untie the two. It's in order to get the consent, we need to work with the regional council to establish... It will You've be got on look, mute, Tonya. Yeah. So it, will, it will be millions. You know, um, resource consents are expensive. Um, full stop. Um, it, it all depends. Um, we're hoping we can do it cheaper than we would normally have to do because we've got a lot of information about that stream, the background, the characteristics, the um, the soil types, all that type of thing. So you know, we're not not starting with a clean sheet, but the, the resource consents are very expensive. So at what and point we, does yeah. this? Consult with it. The part that often gets missed is that we have to then we have to always go and consult with our communities in Mana Whenua. So because we're heading down a slightly different path, we do need to restart that work so that will yeah, add yeah. additional cost. Yeah. But at what point do you come back to council and say, "Hey, look, we've we've spent this much on resource consents." At, at what point do we get to know those figures? Well, well you've got you've got a budget. Happen. You've got a budget now, and so. Um, which we can we can advise you, and it's a, a, if it looks like so, the things that will drive out the costs of a resource consent is by so the first step is um, we should we should have a good handle on what we'd need to put into an um, assessment of environmental effect for a ten year consent for a short term consent. We should should have enough information, and we're building the little bits that we need, which Simon is just talking about, mm -hmm. to try and do that. So that what drives your resource consent from there is actually the number of, of parties who submit. And um, and uh, uh, if there's strong community opposition um, or people's opposition to it, that drives cost, and it can drive cost into the hearings process, um, the evidence that's required to be exchanged between parties, the negotiation, the time, all that type, legal fees. So, um, and then you know, and then you can actually have a hearing, and it could be granted, right? Then someone appeals it to the yeah. environment court, and you start all over again. So. Brenda, that's why you can't say definitively this is how much a resource consent is going to cost. Okay. So so yeah. that just lead, leads me on to my final question. With the consenting process, please, 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 can you put in there transparency? Because a lot of people will invite <clears throat> you on this if they're not being told the process or what's going on. Look, that's what's landed us in this in, in this area in the first place is the lack of transparency and the lack of consultation. Yeah, no, so no, no take totally, into consideration. I could not agree more. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Simon, how did you get on? Yeah, I, I hopefully I can uh, share the screen and. Um, uh, da, 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 yep. Um, where am I? Linda, I need I need some help here. I think. <laughs> okay, so it's coming through now. Can you see oh, it? Yeah. Woohoo! Okay, so I don't know if you're getting my voice as well. You can see the different uh, stages of that. That's the inlet pipe, and there are two tanks, and you can see the plastic media being agitated in the uh, fire tank, which is the first stage, that one. Uh, 
there's some chemicals in the blue tank that's just used for the carbon feed. Yeah. We're getting a little of feed back there, so I'm going to... That's an intro. It's the noise of the little machine, I think, actually. Yeah. Um, when yeah. I looked at it here before, it's, it's quite a noisy little sucker. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it, it, it's really to, just to give you some idea. Um, let me stop sharing so I can get back. Just give you some idea that where it's, things are happening um, that isn't treating a lot of effluent, but it's, it's enough to give us some, some solid data on, on how that sort of system performs. And I think it's going to be vital to get that information also to the regional council to say, look, we are we are progressing. We are. Yeah, we're giving a lot of feedback. Have you got the video still running, Simon? Yeah, we're getting recordings. Though. I can't. I can't hear any background. Is it in the in the meeting room? Is it, JP? Um, we're all good here. We can't hear anything. It's a YouTube. Yeah, got it now. Right. Hang on. We're, we're having trouble at our end now, if you can hear me. There you go. Oh, we're away. We're away. Good. Okay. Not me then, <laughs> hopefully. Hang on a sec. The actual keyboard does not work this very much at all. Technology. Thing, the whole thing needs. <laughs> um, just a quick question, Simon, with regards to the um, MBBR that you're using there. Um, for that size, what would that be suitable for? How many people? How many households? Or... Uh, that's, a, that, that's honestly a great question. And... Um, I would have to look. If I took it, it'd only be a guess. If I took a guess, and it would be something like ten to twenty houses. Fantastic. Uh, it's quite. It's quite small. It's a low flow. We have to. We have to remember that a, a lot of the problem we have at at Featherstone is the um, the I and I. So that's water getting into the pipes that we don't want in the pipes. We don't want to treat clean water that falls out the sky but or seeps in from the ground but um if if we have to build a plant to to handle all that water as well then it's going to cost multiples of um of, of the what it should cost just to handle water we don't we don't need so there's there's definitely got to be a project looked at i think for uh, the i and i around featherstone I was just thinking outside the box and for our other rural areas that may be required to put in a wastewater system, this could be one of the solutions they could possibly use. Potentially. This is only a part of the puzzle, though, so yep. um, you have to filter the water first. It's, already, it's taking water from the ponds. The ponds have done some of the yep. work. Yeah. You have to filter the solids out and so on before you can dispose of it. So it's it's only a small piece of the puzzle, but it's a it's an important piece. Um, I was wondering if you could give, um, give, continue giving us updates on how it's going, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, yes, it, sure. it could very well, as you mentioned before, be the answer that we're looking for. Um, but we'd like to know that as we go along. Sure, well, we're collecting data, um, as I say, sampling three times a week, uh, yep. the internet, and that's being analysed. Some of the tests actually take about seven or eight days to complete, like yep. BFD and COD. Um, so we're always going to be kind of 10 days behind on, on, on the sampling data coming in. But we are that's all being recorded, and that's <clears throat> on Wellington Water's uh, data infrastructure. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, well, that's great. I think we've really had a pretty uh, robust sort of a thrash around this. We probably all haven't got the answers that we want. No, but, no. Uh, Look, I, if, if, if this was easy, JP, we would have done it five years ago. You know, um, this is a really complex space. But just, um, Simon, just um, the, the cost of this particular trial, you know, the MBBR, um, what, what, just an order of magnitude. We're talking about 40, 60K. Yeah, between forty and fifty thousand um, dollars. Actually, a lot of that goes towards the cost of the labs for sampling. 
yeah. the setup, setup wasn't too bad. Yeah. <clears throat> So just you know, again, you know, we've actually found a solution um, that, um, and well, part of a solution that actually, you know, so for part of the question is, are we getting value for money and and some of this um, and some of this work? And this is a really good example of some innovation and um, um, and um, a low cost option to try and actually get some definitive data as opposed to speculative and model data. So you know, um, just take that thought with you too. The, uh, can I just add that this sort of technology is. Um, it's pretty easy to containerize, and and it takes up a very small footprint. So, it, it, the, the space on the available flat areas on site to be able to probably put full scale units, if, if that's part of the solution. Yeah. So, okay. if you, so, so, so just and just go there, um, Simon. So, um, if this this option, because this is about. Um, when you ask the question about um, yeah, this replicability somewhere else, so so UV disinfection is the bacteria kind of side of things. This is around um, um, ammoniacal nitrates and those types of things, isn't it? Yes. So this is uh, what 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 um, is, is 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 the main contaminant stream to the stream is um, ammonia nitrates, bit of phosphorus, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So if if we scaled, say this was successful, and we scaled it, um, and what kind of cost for a plant for a population of like Featherstone, you know, um, and including a bit of growth? Um, so what, two thousand four hundred people to say, say it's three thousand people. What what kind of cost would you be looking for it for the for the box containerized box, son? I I wouldn't like to commit to that because I haven't. No, don't commit. I just just an indication. I think we've, the report we've, that Wellington Water have put together gives a. Uh, indication of, of those typical sort of costs and I think the number they've got in that report is is about right for this sort of technology okay um, so what's that number I think it's it, Linda is that about two million I don't have the report right in front of me unfortunately I don't have it in front of me either sorry but we can we can we can pull that information out for you Provide. But you're not talking in the forty to fifty to sixty million. That's what that's wanted to give councils a degree of scale about what this. You know, if, if it proves successful as part of a, a treatment option, there's a whole lot of other stuff that's going to go on. Um, but that's the kind of, you know, cost effectiveness that this kind of option actually does give us. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the terrible thing that you know I'll do, Harry. And that yes, is, yep. this is only part of the solution. I, don't I know. I, know. I'm, I, I hope I was making that really clear. Yeah. Good, good. Yes, yes. So I'm muting again. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Look, it'll be great. To Thanks, get Simon. It. Yeah. Progress. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. As interesting. Progress. Progress reports going to be very important for us. We could actually understand a little bit more as we go along. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Um, right, we've had a pretty good thrash around with that. Um, JP Alistair's got his hand up. Oh, okay. Uh, right. Yeah, just one, one question about the uh, I and I. Um, how much? How much? Obviously, it's three times as much as Greytown or Martinborough. Um, are you looking at a solution that we get that under control before we come up with a solution, or is that going to be, you know? We, 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 um, we, talked, we talked about this a bit at the last webinar, Alistair, and, and um, we've gone away and done a bit of maths on it. Um, and Gary, did you want to just have a quick chat about... I suppose just to let you know why I'm asking the question, because this is a public forum, yeah. so people get an idea about what we talk yeah. about in the webinar is not public. Yeah, there, there, there's a couple of things about the INI. You, 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 you won't get it done in the time frame. And it, there's there's no guarantees that you will get the sort of numbers that you you would like. It will certainly help to and any replacement of uh, of pipes in the system will help to bring the volumes down. Uh, but it's it's only part uh, of the issue. And um, yeah, uh, Simon's right what he said earlier that um, there does need to be a separate project to deal with that, and that would help. We, I don't think you're going to get going to get that time uh, in in the short term. You, you're not going to get enough done to to make a, a massive difference to the size of this treatment plant. Yeah, so we, we've got, our, our Matt said there's 29 kilometres of wastewater network that we would need to renew or replace. Yeah. So that gives you a scale of, of how much work and therefore a bit of the cost. So are we so likely to get that done before the long-term solution, for example, because obviously the long-term solution is going to be significantly more expensive. Well, that that all depend on um, the funding, 
um, we, we would definitely like to make a start because the good thing about I and I is it has an immediate environmental impact as well, and that the exfiltration of wastewater into the environment is usually a byproduct of the infiltration. So it's definitely a good pro project to do, but I think we need to start some work to get that underway for long-term thinking. So my, my next question then is, is that being factored into the discussions that you're having with Wellington Water as um, quality improvement that, because obviously they want to see us making improvements to the system, if we can fix the I&I &I or, or make an improvement of the I&I, &I, that would be part of of the equation for the treatment, would it not, for the consent? It's more likely to be the long-term consent than the short-term consent, Alistair. Um, we're just not going to fix, and we haven't got, we certainly haven't got enough investment to do the short-term solution, I and I, and progress a long-term solution all at the same time. You're not, um, you're not so, going to yeah, so so we've got, we've got a, um, you know, and but you know, we are we're plugging away at the I and I every, every day, basically. Um, with new renewal work and that kind of stuff. We're, going to, we're never going to get this into fixing up 30, 40 kilometres of network, though. Okay. Right, I have Thank you very much for that. We, uh, we need to move on. Um, yep. It gets dark early these days. <laughs> we are now moving to uh, C3 water races. Um, do I have someone to move that we receive this information? Garrett and I'll set you're all in favour. Right, right. right, I'd like to welcome the GW team here. We have David, uh, Gary, of course, and Josie. Um, I cover them all, Aaron? Yep, absolutely. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, you know the background here. Um, natural Resources Plan has um, is now rolling out. Um, new rules come to effect on the 1st of July around stock exclusion. Um, there's obviously, in Greater Wellington, uh, um, informing the rural community um, of what's happening. Um, we, we, a few of you councillors were fortunate to be at the combined council meeting where um, David did the presentation and the, some of the great work they've done in Parkvale around partnering with the community, um, which we think is the, is the way to go forward on this. Um, so we just thought it's really good to um, give you an update um, and um, how, we, how we can work with GWRC to find a good solution for our community. So with that, I'll hand you over, David. Yep. Uh, thanks very much, Harry. I think you've said everything that I wanted to touch on. So, yeah, this <laughs> so is short. This is, um, as we, as we if, uh, apologies in advance. I'm home with the virus, so if I sneeze or sputter or just flat out don't make any sense, I can quite honestly blame it on COVID. Um, yeah. So wish I could, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this this really is about um, supporting the landowners who are using the water race network. That's what it all boils down to. Um, I'll hand you over to Josie Winters, who's a senior land management advisor in my team in just a moment. But um, yeah, as, as we all appreciate, these water races are complex assets um, with all sorts of consenting issues, land user um, use issues, and and adjacent land use, which is really what we're here to talk about today. So um, getting straight to the uh, de detail of the presentation, I'll hand over to Josie. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I will just share my screen. Here we go. Can we all see these slides? Yep. Yep. Yeah, cool. Sorry. Thanks, team. <laughs> um, yeah, so you uh, have all uh, received the briefing um, paper at the meeting in uh, March, along with today's paper to support it. Uh, so you're all well across what's um, the background with the water races and the need for a more collaborative approach. We're managing the water races and the impact they have on the environment. Stock access uh, provides... Um, a great opportunity with being the most pressing issue to uh, adjust the approach that we take with the community to work with all the stakeholders uh, together and um, uh, provide an approach that will help us support the changes that are needed around the more challenging and longer term issues facing uh, the water races. Uh, as you can see here, the reviewing approach when it comes to stock exclusion and the impacts that it has on uh, the function of the water races. They originally created for stock water and the land values and productivity around them were linked largely to this connectivity. 
Um, now the water races have been in situ for so long that they are very much a part of the landscape. They provide habitat values for um, fish, invertebrates, aquatic vegetation, shallow aquifer recharge. They're also part of the wider ecological system, connecting streams, river systems, wetlands, and the wildlife of Moana. Uh, there are also lots of challenges, as you're all well aware of. Uh, the community values now surrounding them can be a little bit different, and we have not had great action around uh, stock exclusion, um, and some of this will be linked to, to confusion around the requirements for it. You're all well aware of the changing regulations that are coming in um, around them, not only directly related to the water races, but the wider environment around them. Uh, we are always updating good management practices and implementing these are always quite important, but creating consistency around the messaging for it is really key. Otherwise, again, it just adds to confusion. I'm sure I don't need to detail the impacts of aging infrastructure um, as a challenge. Uh, it, with all the relationships we have across our organizations, the key will be um, coordination so we can make the most of it to really create change um, across catchment. And climate change is always the looming threat that will affect our long-term water supply and uh, all the things engaging with the environment. So there's lots going on and today's focus is quite clearly on stock exclusion, but we can come back and cover off some other aspects in the future if desired. Regulation, it's here. Um, I apologize for how much information is within this particular slide, um, but the 2022 regulations are the key ones that kick in around water races. They come into effect this year, and that means that stock need to be excluded or are in breach of the rules. Our preferred approach is to work with people to become compliant, and stock exclusion doesn't necessarily mean fencing, but it's certainly the most common approach taken. Stock exclusion changes how land users engage with the water races and the land surrounding them, in particular when it comes to stock water, crossings and maintenance of the water races themselves. How stock exclusion is approached can have wide reaching impacts on the full network and needs involvement across all the stakeholders to maximize positive outcomes. Uh, this slide and um, more details provided to Gary and the team as well. Uh, where we should go from here, as has been said many a times, a collaborative approach um, is the desired outcome on how we can achieve stock exclusion, but then also develop um, an approach that will help us tackle some of these broader and um, meatier issues when it comes to water races. Um, lots of regulation is coming at them and uh, the broader catchment health is our why. Uh, GW has a lot of um, resources that we can provide to support uh, sharing the good management practice around stock exclusion and we have funding support for fencing, planting and advice um, and some small <laughs> funding support for articulation. But ultimately our um, big gains will be had from aligning our messaging and working together uh, around water races, in particular around stock exclusion. That's my quick fire presentation around um, working together on the water races and conscious that you guys have been in here for a wee while, but I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, Josie. I think we're all pretty aware of uh, what has to be done. Um, just before we go to question, um, Colin, could you give us an update or you have some bad yeah. Probably not a lot more um, in terms of detail, uh, other than we knew that this was coming, I guess. Um, and uh, the the um, subcommittee have met uh, now, certainly uh, for some time, uh, to discuss these proposals. I, I understand that an invitation was sent out to the subcommittee to attend this today. I'm not sure if that occurred. Or not, not yet. Uh, Sorry, not, not yet. No. So, so really, that, that group needs to be informed. Uh, my, my question is um, um, farm management plans and water races. Uh, is, is, um, uh, are water races included? I know that other water bodies are, but are water races actually included in a farm management plan? 
Are you referring to our existing plans or to the regulatory plans that are proposed under the freshwater? Uh, so more the regulatory plans? There's no clarity around what's going to be included in those plans just yet, so we can't um, provide detail on it, but I'd be surprised if there wasn't some sort of inclusion. Right, so, so that... Okay, yeah, I can, I can add a bit further to that. Um, Josie's spot on. The, the regulations are still a moving feast in terms of what will re be required on the national scene of freshwater farm plans, um, which is linked to the RMA. And there's also planning um, updates relevant to our regional plan that have to deal with freshwater farm plans. Now, I think in short, um, the answer to that question is yes. When we consider the environmental risks and opportunities on a, on a property, um, water races will certainly be in there. So good management practice in, in and adjacent to the water race will most definitely be in a freshwater farm plan, I would think. So um, David, can I just, because um, I mean, the, the capture is, is by definition, um, forget the term water race, but it's judged as a waterway under the National Resources Plan, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. for, so, so, for, so whatever the freshwater standard specifies for a waterway, um, then by definition, a water race would be captured. So I think that's yeah. the answer to your question, Colin. It won't be about specifying water races in a farm management plan. It'll be how a farm management plan deals with waterways full stop. Yeah, okay. exactly. So, well said. So, so further to that question, uh, uh, the TAs are ultimately the uh, consent holders for the water race network. Is that likely to change under a new regime or...? Will the TA still be responsible for being the consent holder? I might have to pass that to Harry for his opinion on the question, but I'll give mine <laughs> first. Um, so, um, so the, the consent is um, is largely to do with the take and discharge. Um, okay. So um, then the use, actually there's some quite interesting case law that's um, just emerged about use as part of the, um, the consent requirement for take down south, um, but it, um, it, to, to operate a the, the water race itself, um, yeah, uh, but it's largely the take and um, the, the interesting question actually in all this is going to be the discharge um, at, the, at the point that it enters another waterway. Um, if you, uh, I think that's where the interesting regulatory question is going to emerge. Um, yes, I, yeah. I, I agree entirely, Harry, and uh, I think this gets down to the concept of what we refer to as diffuse discharge. So yeah. it's all of the discharge across the range of land uses that are within the water race catchment. And at some point, it's likely that the water race will be tested at the downstream end of the pipe where the discharge contaminants are getting back into the receiving system, whatever it might be. And some of that water quality will be attributable to all the different types of land use within the catchment, which the water race is enabling. So really, um, it, it does get a bit murky in terms of regulatory responsibility of who's responsible for that discharge. Uh, it's, it's all of the above. Uh, if, we're, if we're trying to regulate water quality on a catchment basis, which is what we're shifting towards on a, on a national scene. So further for that, again, is that the TA carries out the responsibility for um, its bylaw um, under the new stock exclusion, uh, which will occur in uh, August, this August, I think. Yep. Um, will will the TA be responsible for policing and enforcing uh, that stock exclusion rule, or will that fall? Within oh the no, case? no, that's definitely a GW jurisdiction. Oh, yeah. So uh, we're we're considering these. The point that um, Harry made just a moment ago is that these are considered waterways, um, category two water bodies, by definition in our regional plan. And compliance with the stock exclusion rule rules is a responsibility for our consent authority to, to deal with. But I think that the point here that Josie and I are communicating with you is that GW's approach to this is coming from a starting point of non-regulatory support. Um, that's, that's a very key take home message here that we are not sort of gearing up our resources to send the compliance officers out there. We're gearing up our resources with land management programs, which offer advice and cash incentives for people to comply with the regs. Thank you. <clears throat> Alistair, do you have a... Uh... Oh, yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you for that. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here. Um, obviously, in, in Masterton, when they when a lot of these rules started coming into place, they, um, the landowners and affected farmers looked at closing down the uh, OPACI scheme. 
um, but that was denied by the regional council, if I'm correct, because of the um, how it had become an uh, ecological life for fish and plants and so on and so forth. So, so that water race is still continuing. Is that, is that correct in there? I can't really comment on the background of whether or not a a proposal from Masterton to shut down the the water race was denied by GW. I'm not aware of that, but I, I think. The issues we're talking about here of long-term water race viability and stock exclusion are two separate things. Um, well, well, so well there's, sort of, there's sort of not a little bit because if I take you down the, the, where I'm where I'm thinking of what a lot of farmers where I live and I'm down a, sort of right in the middle of all these water races along with Garrick and so on. Um, so the farmers are obviously really interested in that. Um, if they then if if they have to fence off the land. Some of these farmers will be losing in, in excess of 10, 15 hectares of their land. Um, so is there going to be compensation for that? And if there's not, then they're going to say, well, what's the point of me having this? And then it comes back to the question and say, well, okay, if the if the users then were to say, we don't want this anymore because the cost of us fencing this outweighs the benefit, then they say to the council, we don't want you to renew the consent. At that stage, it then comes up to the question and say, can council not put water down this because of the ecological life in the water race? Do you see where this is going? Yeah, yeah. I just the point I was trying to make, I didn't quite get to it. The the issue with long term water race viability north of Masterton has been the condition of the riverbed more so than anything related to stock exclusion and the adjacent land use in the in the water race network. The Masterton has had quite a quite a challenge getting water to leave the room hunger river and go into the opeki water race exactly the same reason why the teoriori water race shut down uh, around five years ago is just because of the degrade in the riverbed they can't get the water in right. um you, you're dead right the, the stock exclusion requirements will cause some subtle changes in land use uh i i'm doubtful that that will be a decision maker or breaker in terms of whether the water races remain open. It, it is just fairly um, moderate land use adjustment. I think for the most part, people can carry on doing what they're doing. Well, I, I, you know, there are two farmers within five kilometers of where I live who have got um, 10 kilometers of, of, um, of water race through their farms, 10 to 15 kilometers. So that's, um, you know, that's a significant cost to fencing and yep. being to put in water articulation. You know, we're talking upwards of probably thirty to $40,000 to, to do that work. Um, um, look, that's Alistair, really worth it. Yeah. Look, that's, that's an issue with waterways full stop. It's nothing to do with, um, well, obviously, um, water races are captured by that, but by, by the same issue. It's around the freshwater standards and what they require for stock exclusion for waterways full stop. Well, it's just, I'm just sort of trying to, I'm trying to get in my mind, you know, at what stage can a farmer whose water race goes through their land say, I can't afford this and I can't do this, so I'm going to fill it in. What rights do they have? Because at the end of the day, these water races, I understand, whilst the consent is held by the council, who actually owns them? That's that's sort of the, the, the tricky question here. Yeah, yeah. But look, I, I think the thing is more likely to come to a head over the consent to take. Um, so, you know, if, if by definition, a consent is not granted to take, there is no flow to a water race. End of story. But then, but then that brings back the question of the ecological value of this and say, yeah. fish and, yeah. and the, and the does. council might say, you have to take, you can't not take. Yeah, I think the, the uh, another key take home message here is that the, the state of management of these water races is going to change. Um, it, it has been gradually changing over quite some time to get us to the point we are here in 2022. I think the, the combination of, of, intake challenges with the consent, um, land use challenges, stock exclusion, et cetera, we are gonna see a shift in how we manage these assets. Um, what we're here talking with you about today is we wanna support landowners complying with those stock exclusion regs. Well, I, you know, I, I suppose, you know, there's hundreds of kilometers of this stuff and, I, and Colin will probably back me up on this, that these are some of the, the questions I'm raising are not unusual questions that, no. that are going to be raised um, by the very farmers on these hundreds of kilometers. Yep. Um, and in fact, they, they were raised with me just last week. So, you know, these are these are questions that we need to be able to go out and answer. So it's all very well saying, oh, these are the rules. But actually, we haven't got the answers to these questions. So it's all very well having a book rule. But we need practical solutions so that we as councillors 
and we as people, and, and particularly like Colin in, in, the, in the subcommittee, who are talking to the farmers on, on a daily basis can actually provide guidance and suggested outcomes to this. Otherwise, we're going to end up with just non-compliance or, or people just bulldozing them in. David, would you like to I was going to say, David, would you like to comment about the Park Vale trial, or you, where you just walked in, literally walked into those kind of discussions um, to try and work with, sure. with the community? Yeah, I think that's yeah, a really sure. So, point. just a very brief brief background here: the Park Vale catchment area was sort of given a um, a strong ringing of the alarm bells a few years ago when the national freshwater regulations were put out, and the Park Vale catchment was listed on a draft schedule of of so called problem catchments mainly for nitrogen. Um, subsequently, the, the final version of those regulations, Parkville was not included, but that, that was sort of the catalyst for this group coming together. Um, so that's going on a couple of years now. And we're to the point now where we're, we're really looking at the water race from a long-term planning perspective, which is exactly what we're here to support. Um, looking at from a catchment health perspective and long-term risks and opportunities. So in the Park Vale, we've got Cardiff and District Council on board, obviously. They're, they're supportive, in fact, leading the, the long-term thinking of this. And look, it really comes down to understanding where the, the key stems of the water race are and the management intent for those. There's a lot of the Teratahi water race in the Park Vale catchment, by the way, is, is by far the most significant water race network in the Wadarapa. And it's, it's just the, a mixed approach of understanding the long-term objective for the asset. Some areas are, are quite appropriately go, up, able to be retired. So coming up with a, um, a retirement plan of which segments of the race might be bulldozed in, as you say, Councillor Plimmer, um, in which case you wouldn't invest in permanent fencing or native planting alongside the margins of those areas. So look, I think what we're hoping to achieve is a roughly 10 year plan of where we want to be in terms of where the, <clears throat> the management of these water races and then some action planning to get, help get us there. So we're, we're not expecting full permanent stock per fencing to be up on the 1st of August. Um, that's, that's quite unrealistic. However, there's, there's good practice and there's bad practice and we're helping people get on the path towards good. And there's all sorts of variations of that, whether it's permanent fencing, hot wire fencing, um, not putting cattle in certain paddocks, only having your mobs of sheep in, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, David. Uh, Garrett, you have a question? Yeah, two, hi, David. Uh, two or three. Um, obviously, the, the classic one about Greytown with uh, stock or storm water is still not resolved. Is that correct? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Sorry? There's, the, the, there's an ongoing discussion about stock water at becoming storm water in Greytown and then reverting back to stock water. I'm assuming that question has not been resolved. So I'm um, from a um, from the context of this meeting, Garrick, this is about stock exclusion. So yeah, no, no, no that's a, that's a whole different that's a whole different. So they're, they're excluded yeah. outside Greytown, but not in Greytown outside Greytown. So if we're testing the water before and after, then it's I'll be blaming it on Greytown, but that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, may, can I just on the rating situation? We end up in a situation where we've uh, uh, we've feast off land, which I'm paying water rates on. Um, I can't use it as stock, and I'm also paying rates on that account, so I'm double rated on land I can't use. So, look, Gary, all I can suggest is you do a submission to the um, to the I, plan, I you know, be, regional I, council plan on the rating issue to do with yeah, it. It's, no, I tried oh, no, that David issue. isn't really the man to answer that question. Much as he, I'm sure he knows a shitload about things, I but tried that the rating issue. mechanisms, yeah, I'm, I'm sure he's not over. Response, so that's okay. Um, yeah. With the um, when we talk about the uh, funding supplement, what sort of money are we talking about and what sort of criteria are you looking at? Uh, yeah, rough, simply it's, it's roughly a 50% grant on most things, um, ranging from a third to 50% grant from the regional council. It's a, it's a little bit different whether we're talking about fencing or native plant material at the moment. That's due to partnerships we have with Ministry for Primary Industries, who's also putting some money into these support programs. Uh, but the, the land management advice component is 100% regional funded. So 
advice from our land management advisors of, of what you should do about it, um, farm system adjustments, maintaining land use, improving good management practice, getting all of this into a farm environment plan of some sort, that service we're providing free of charge as far as the, land, as the, as the landowners are concerned. And then when, the, when it comes to delivering actions under these freshwater farm plans or farm environment plans, same thing, the action delivery is where those cash grants of either a third to a 50% come in. Yeah, okay, so, so the rates that will be paid by, that we are paying for water rates now, that'll be going to you in terms of enforcement? No, no, Garrick, so um, the rate, sorry, you're talking about uh, the rates that we collect? Water yeah. rates. Yeah. Water rates. Water no, rates no, so, so they so stay with us, they don't go anywhere near GWRC for their, their enforcement um, cable it comes out of their out of their general rating um, functions. Okay, right, um, and obviously there's no compensation. So you know, per hectare goes, that's uh, sorry, per kilometre, that's a hectare gone. No, that's that's right. I mean, in fact, actually, it's um, and Daniel might know this. Um, David might know this. Um, so one of the things about a regional plan, so a district plan um, creates existing use rights. So um, if you change a rule in a plan, the existing use uh, continues until it expunges. When you change a regional policy statement or a plan, there is no compensation in uh, section 67, I can't remember where it is, um, but the, so it's explicit. So the regional council has the ability to change land use, um, which may have a, um, a, a, a create a, um, a liability, um, and there's no, there's no requirement, legal requirement under regional plan to pay compensation. This is getting back to what Alistair said, you know, I'm talking to farmers as well. They're saying at that sort of rate, you know, you, you're yeah. tend, and, and, you and look, I had that exact example in um, Lake yeah. Taupo with bandeering. You know, we bandeering in Lake Taupo and people say, well, you're, you're affecting my future and all that kind of stuff, so why aren't you paying us compensation? And, um, you know, we just, you didn't, basically. Um, and so, I mean, the, the RMA is very explicit. At a regional level, you can change land use um, and there's no legal requirement to pay compensation. Okay, the other, just on the water race thing, is it possible to not close but divert? We had a look at that. I know when we're doing the consents at, at Hodder, one of the suggestions from South Wairat was to stop the problem of the water races was in fact to divert it. Is that a possibility? Divert to where, Garrick? What, what are you thinking? Well, if they're branches, so you close one off and you divert it to another branch. Well, those kind of management options are always possible. It depends on, you know, if, if that has a, um, a positive effect in terms of um, stock exclusion and those types of things, anything can happen. Yeah. I think you're right. I think that everything's worth looking at. Yeah. Uh, but we are getting off track okay. a wee bit here, but... Um, That's all right. I mean, it's the network, effectively. It's like nothing, you know, to a certain extent, it's nothing like turning off the pipe, really. Um, apart, from the, apart from the stranded macroinvertebrates at the bottom of the bottom of the waterway, but um, that's a different argument. <laughs> right, okay. Thanks, guys. Look, we've yeah, got a couple of... Yeah. Uh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, yeah. David. Thanks, yeah, David. Very good. Yeah, David, great. Um, just, just, um, just for those who don't know, David's also um, the one who's helping us, has provided invaluable support with Hinakura. Um, so, David, thank you. Um, want to both on both counts, you know, for the information on the water race. Thank you, JC, but also thank you for your ongoing support with Hinakura. Much appreciated. Oh, thank you. Hey, we're all public servants, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, well said, David. Well said. Hey, look, we've got a couple of recommendations here. There's uh, point two, and the first is to note the immersion regulatory requirements and potential, the word is potential, change of ownership under the proposed free waters reform. And we also uh, agree, I just want to change the wording a little bit, agree to work with uh, GWRC and stakeholders to implement the water race stock exclusion requirements. Would someone like to move? It's on the uh, page 59 there, Garrett. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, can I just make a comment on that last clause, work with GWRC and stakeholders and, uh, to implement the water race stock exclusion requirement? I understand from David's presentation that uh, GW are actively working uh, with those landowners, or will we, um, as we venture? Would that be correct, David? So do we need that? Uh, yeah, but I guess this is through our water uh, yeah, Look, um, Colin, we do, in a certain extent, because we um, we've got the bylaw, 
and so you know, the bylaw has a code of practice. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so um, you know, we should we should be making sure that um, yeah. our uh, bylaw is changed and reflects yeah, um, the, the rule. Yeah. Thank you. Just, just to um, for information. The Water Race Committee and the Māori Standing Committee were invited to this meeting. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had the opportunity. Great. Uh, Jeppe, someone... Jeppe, before you do that, can we just uh, ask um, either of our Greater Wellington reps a little bit more on the possible uh, implications with three waters on water races? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> That is a very good question, which I don't think we can answer today. I mean, I'd be um, well and truly out of my depth trying to read the crystal ball on that one, but I'd be happy to arrange a follow-up workshop or council attendance from GW people on this one later on, if you'd like to um, put that in the actions. Right. Oh, thanks, thanks, David. And there Thank is um, just a, there is a special working group um, led by a guy named Philip Isles, um, who actually used to work for me. Um, from DIA, and they are looking at. We have been active in making the dealing with stormwater, um, and we've been active in making sure that um, the treatment of water races in the context of stormwater has, has um, is on the on the agenda. So, it's there. Um, we have no idea. Um, the current, the last um, thing I heard from them was that what they were going to do was basically kick of a touch. Um, is not. Um, as water races would remain as a contract uh, op option of a contracted service to the um, three waters entity, um, or councils could just continue operating themselves, but not in terms right now. The recommendations were not to acquire water races as part of the three waters transfer. I mean, that's the, that's the latest I have. Yeah, um, Councillor Jepson, you're um, chairing, correct? Could I just have the floor yes. for a moment? Um, yeah, thank you. Sorry for butting in. I just wanted to propose an action um, if this committee is happy to accept this that, that Harry and I just keep on, keep in touch in terms of whether GW attendance at a future workshop or uh, sorry a committee meeting is necessary I, I appreciate there's forums that are lots of forums that are dealing with this three waters topic and the information may flow into this committee on its own rather than us teeing up a bespoke three waters water races uh, yeah. agenda item at a future meeting so if if the action is just for harry and myself to keep in touch on if gw representation is needed then we'll take care of that um if yeah. if so no, needed. Good to have it. yeah All absolutely right. no, that's good. do we need to make that an extra item harry no i just think it's a note um that, that, that just that, what it basically means is um we'll get back if we think this is something the committee needs to know we'll get back to you okay right um, no, just before you go on there brian uh councillor uh, jeppy Hang on, uh, Brenda, I'm just about to say something. Just yeah. before we go on to the recommendations here, I'll just, uh, Brenda, you have something to say. Yeah, um, so um, consultation with regards to the water races, it's a, it's a real hot topic. Um, the original requirement that we've come to the understanding that Josie has actually um, informed us is that it was originally for stock water and it's, it's, it's evolved. Um, so if it's evolved into something more, uh, what, what I don't get is now we are now passing, passing the requirement for our farmers to actually do more at their own expense. So I'm just wondering how, how do we communicate that better or how, how do we get around that? Is there well, a way around uh, that? We're, we're not... Um asking farmers to do it as a requirement of the RMA that's um, GW's responsibilities. Is that right, David? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, really, it's um, we are raising the bar in terms of land use expectations next to these water races. And it's <clears throat> the, and there will be a cost um, coming out of the pockets of landowners. There's no doubt about that. The, the message here is that we, GW is targeting our support programs, our incentives to try to help them get the job done. Um, I appreciate that won't be a um, well-received message with some. They'll, they'll, there will be those out there that think um, somebody else should pay 100% of the cost rather than a third. Um, but I think this is, this is not unique by any means in terms of changing land use over time. Our, just to compare this to our biggest um, program that my team works with, which is Hill Country Erosion, we're, we're largely dealing with problems that were created by government subsidies 
in originally with stripping the vegetation off the hill country. And in order to fix that, landowners are dipping in their pockets to try to undo things of, of legacy decisions that were made. It's exactly the same with the water races where they now have a very high um, relevance to ecological health in, in a catchment basis. And we're not saying that the water races need to be turned off or stopped. We're saying, saying that the way that landowners use them, it needs to change in order with the regulations which are aimed at catchment health. I, I get that, but um, the environmental, um, the environmental, um, let's see, the environmental requirement for having those has changed, and it's no longer just up to the farmer. It's up to everybody, but where it, tar- it appears that farmers are being targeted because it, it goes through, it goes through urban. The, the water races go through urban uh, urban towns. So why is it just up to the farmer to take on the cost for that? Oh, that's a very good point, which we didn't quite deal with explicitly. This, these support programs that we're discussing today are very much targeted at, at the rural land users. Yeah. The, the issue of urban uh, water race users and what's going on and the contributions of of water quality in the urban network that's that's probably um more relevant to the district council's management of stormwater in general rather than the landowners that are that have a water race going through their little sections in town so yeah that that is a good point but uh, it is important to note that these these are rural land use support programs that we're talking about today yep Cool. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, now, we do need to move on because, as I said before, it does get dark early. Uh, so, like, as I mentioned before, we have two recommendations. First, to note the emergency regulatory requirements and potential change of ownership under the proposed free waters reform. And secondly, agree to work with GWRC and stakeholders to implement the water race stock exclusive requirements. Do we have someone to move that? Alex, seconder? Evening. We all in favour? No. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Right. Thanks, um, GW team. Very good. Uh, we know your phone number, so if we have a problem, we'll give you a bill. Excellent. Thank you. We'll sign out now. Yes, yes. <laughs> right. We're moving on to C4. And I guess you've all had a good look at this. Um, the eco reef at Cape Palliser Road. Um, would someone like to move to receive it? Yep. Yeah. Oh, oh, that was the second or the favour. All right. All right. Now, look, <clears throat> it is at a very uh, early stage. Um, and we have had a couple of good swells. It has stayed in place. Uh, except just at the southern end with a swell, and it was always expected, has gone around. I mean, there's something you've got to work on. You just the can't. swell has moved past. Yep. Yeah. 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 So they moved the concrete. No, 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 no. And they haven't moved. Oh, right. from one end. I mean, water's got to go somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was always an issue. I think the biggest problem is. Um, we did want to do it around the corner at Turner's Bay. And um, unfortunately, because of the, uh, Fort Hogan's um, issues with COVID and uh, short stuff, Fred Waker, who designed these, he had the same issue. So he, because Fred's supplying these uh, eco reefs for nothing. So he wanted to be there to see it established and oversee it. And he's had to go back to his workshop. So we're, I think, Harry, we're delaying it till the spring. Is that right? No, it's in, isn't it? The, no, um, no, 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 the second yeah. one. This one's in. I'm oh, look, oh, no, sorry, no, sorry. Um, no, I only know the information that's in the in the report. I don't know anything about yeah. the second stage. Um, yeah, I just want to give you a heads up because we were initially going to do three sites and then it was cut to two and now it's one. Yeah. But look, yeah, but one was, um, yeah, it was outside the dock area and they weren't happy yeah. about that, but yeah. Um, but remember, it's a trial, you know, so the whole thing is to oh, okay. Yeah. It's, so I visited on the weekend, um, and it's stunning to look at the erosion there prior to installation. I, I'd forgotten how close it had uh, 
started eating away up the road. It looks bloody awesome. Yeah. Oh my yeah, God. Cool. Yeah. And there's, it doesn't look like there's been any movement so far. And you can tell by the seaweed really how high the seas have got there. Uh, and it, all the fill is still intact yep. uh, on everything. So very yeah, impressed. After that big swell, yeah. 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 The, the, there is the ability, and, and Fred Waker and Henrik and Sarah are uh, going to try it. They're going to plant some pina, which is a native uh, plant along the top, and it grows right on sea level. Uh, it's, it's a plant that's actually under threat. And um, pretty uh, European Maori used it for the uh, dyes and the mukus and the cattle oh, yeah. So anyway, that, this ongoing trial, and... Because I live right there, I see it most days I get past, it's brilliant. And I'll no, cool. hats off to Fred and, and Rick Waker um, for designing something like this. So oh, I know. No, the, 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 actually, the thing I did want to actually mention is um, you know, the infill to the pods themselves just came from um, extraction from local rivers, and which we yeah. did under GWRC consents, you know. Yeah. So, um, didn't give us consent. We they made it available to us, like similar that they did with Donald's Creek. Yep. Um, so I, I think that's you know that's a that's a really important thing to note. You know, often um, you know the cooperation we have. G A W is good. Yep. Oh. It also looks like they've extracted enough for three trials. There's still massive piles of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's another reason. For yeah, that, yeah. We <laughs> Never let a chance go by, Alex. Absolutely. Colin, um, excuse me, oh, I've got to go, unfortunately. Uh, so, oh, oh, thanks for your input. No, no um, Colin, that's great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Adair. Thanks, guys. Right. We've done that bit. We're now moving on to the action item. Someone like to move? We receive the um, action item report to Gary to us. <laughs> Gary, uh, <laughs> oh, so it might be a quick, might be a quick one then. <laughs> All favour. Right. All right. Good. Right, Alistair, you had your hand up, so you obviously got a question. Very quick. No, I was just um, saying yes to the um, all in favour. <laughs> Oh, you yeah. haven't got any questions, and good, it will be quick. Can I, uh, 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 301 can be actioned, I think. Um, I can, indeed. I was just looking at that. It's um, no, it's now reported, so that can report as actioned, yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't make, oh, I did. No, I didn't. Number 484, how are we going with our new environmental um, uh, our officer with regards to... Um, the initiatives for waste minimization, or is that how we? Being and so remember, we um, we'd asked um, that that um, we're going to have a report to the next access and services committee on all this, because um, that wraps up the far recommendation in this, so we can bring all that um, all together. Because there's quite a lot <laughs> moving in this space. Um, you were seeing that I sent out to you some of the governments now legislated certain other um, elements of the waste stream um, being banned. So it's going to be an interesting, interesting time, actually. But I mean, in terms of the, so the officer has started, and just to, to um, um, Amanda and uh, Mandy, and so yes, yeah, she's. Um, but currently, she's looking after Bryce's portfolio while he's away on leave. Yep, I've got no other questions. Uh, now, Alistair, you um, you had a question for what's at the start of the. Um, Meaning. No, we, we covered that one, didn't we? We've, we've covered that, but I, I do note here that they're talking about, Harry, I see their action amended to include speed limit. Well, that means we're going to have to go out and consult on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not quite sure that's really the smartest way to do this. No, well, yeah. I, I, actually, I don't think that should read or consider, because um, the whole point was not to just cherry pick just because someone says we want to change my spirit speed limit on this road. Um, is to do it fully and comprehensively. Um, so I, I think we probably should amend that action, actually. Which one was that, Alex? That, um, That's 516. Five, one, six. Five, one, six. Yeah, I just, yeah. I've got 516. Yeah. I'd, I'd say um, action to consider amending 
advanced changing of the speed limit. I, d- I just, no, I would, just, I would take it that. out, take it out, com- take it out completely because that's yeah, that's, yeah, because you've got the one above it, which is is to include it as this part of the speed review. Yeah, we were, we were always going to do that because it's a it's a yeah. rural middle road. Okay, so, um, look, Jeff, the, is, the issue are you is, happy? Is happy that we revert yeah. to the original? Yeah. yeah. So okay, so let's um, delete the last part of the notes, which is actions are meant to include advanced changing of speed limits on Underhill Road. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We still need to have something done about the safety uh, on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and speed but the one above it, the one above it says Underhill Road will be included as part of the speed review. So. Well, we'll, 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 we'll five one six. Yeah. But read bottom of the page. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, well, un- unfortunately, again, with that one, Harry, is the speed review probably will not be done by the time that bridge is finished and ready to open. Um, given, given uh, but the- well, neither, neither will a, um, even if you went down the path of trying to change that, you still have to, it's a um, bylaw process, consultation. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, is this, so is this, you know, it's not going to, yeah, you're not going to change it. So I, th- I think Tim needs to perhaps put a bit of thought in his mind about how we can separate bikes from vehicles on Underhill Road on both sides of the river, really. I think that's yeah. that's where we need to look at this. Mm. Yeah. You know. Indeed. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Right. Cheers, guys. Um, just one last thing. Uh, I'd like to note that uh, Katrina is leaving, as you well know, on Friday. Um, I would uh, like to thank her for... Um, her work over the past year or two, she got chucked into the hot seat when Jenny left, and uh, and it was a big learning curve for her. And I, I believe she did a great job, and um, I wish her all the very best for her new role. So, yeah, well, thanks, yeah. Jeff. I think, yeah, yeah, that's nice. And um, actually, if you wouldn't mind, as chair, just dropping her a note saying that you actually did say this, and she goes, she's not in attendance, so just let her know that um, you, you had, did make this mention. That'd be great. I, I signed her card at the what's name, but I will drop her. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. No, she's done an amazing job. Yeah. Okay. Well, Thank you, guys. We got there. I'll see you all in um, a week's time when I get back from Australia.